Good evening and welcome to the April 25th, 2016 meeting of the Town Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're slightly understaffed, so I'm going to... I can. Happy to. I'll call the roll myself, unless Dan really wants to. Oh, I'm, I'm happy go ahead, to. Dan. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. We're not understaffed. Um, I'll try yeah. to fill in for Ms. Patterson. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. Bealy? Here. Uh, Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Wood? Here. Mr. Mazur? And Chairman Fellows? Here. So no Mr. Mazur this evening? Thank you, Dan. Uh, and note that in the absence of uh, Mr. Mazur, Mr. Bealey will be a voting member this evening. Next item is the approval of minutes from the April 4th, 2016 meeting. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Item number four, the planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on amendments to the zoning map. This zoning map amendment proposes to, to proper, proposes to property, <laughs> relates proposes to property, to, yeah proposes to rezone, rezone property identified <laughs> on the Scarborough tax maps as U39 lot 41 from general business district B3 to residential 4 R4. The property is further identified as 11 Willowdale Road. Dan? Thank you. And given the agenda's lack of clarity, um, this is a proposal to change the zoning for 11 Willowdale Road from the general business district. Right now it's in the general business district or the B3, known as the B3 zone, to the residential four district. And this is a property that abuts the residential four zone to the south. Uh, it's really a transition property from properties along Route 1 that are zoned business to properties down Willowdale Road that are zoned residential. Um, so I think Karen Martin's here to present this on behalf of the applicant, um, but this went to the Long Range Planning Committee and went to the Council for first reading, so it's before you for public hearing this evening. Thanks, Good Dan. evening. Go ahead, Thank Karen. you. I'm Karen Martin with the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation, and I am here to, on behalf of Mr. Paul Russo, who owns the property. And I've been working with Mr. Russo for the last year or so um, on the property it, in its current condition, which is um, the commercial zone. It does have a residence that's been converted to office um, on the uh, site right now. We've been trying to get that rented and working through um, different uses, commercial uses for that for that site, and it really just hasn't been all that effective. And so Mr. Russo is very interested now in coming back and looking at doing residential development. It seems to make sense considering um, to one side, actually to both sides, he has uh, single family residential units. And across the street is still zone uh, B3, um, but this particular uh, property does seem to make, have a lot of um, merits for going residential, and it is what the uh, property owner would like to do. Um, in looking at this, we worked with the Long Range Planning Committee and talked about a, um, a number of different options and, in fact, whether or not there are some other properties um, in the area that might also want to be rezoned uh, residential. We did reach out to some of those surrounding property owners, um, and at this point, uh, the property on the opposite side of the street, there are actually two properties there. They really do want to retain their commercial zoning, and certainly we understood that, so um, we didn't want to do any rezoning on that particular, on those two properties. So again, this is a um, case where the, res where the owner would really like to do um, duplexes at this point, and um, that's, that's really his, his plan, and um, pretty straightforward in terms of changing from the B3 to um, R4. Thanks, Karen. 
this is a public hearing, which I'll open in a moment. Um, just to reset the ground rules, anyone who'd like to come up and speak, just uh, give your name and address and limit your comments to five minutes. And I'll open the public hearing. All right. Seeing no takers, I will close the public hearing. And we'll move on to board discussion. Um, Susan, would you like to start off? Surprise. Um, I'm familiar with the piece of property. I have met Mr. Russo a couple of different times. I think the idea is um, perfectly fine. I say that because I know that whatever happens if this passes in terms of development will come back to the board for review because the land is a particularly interesting and challenging piece of property to develop. And that doesn't worry me because we'll see it. And with that in mind, it's, I'm, I'm fine with it. Thank you. Roger? Uh, I, I don't have any problem with this. Robin? Likewise. No Thanks. comment. Hey, Ron? I'm OK. Nick? I'm OK. Mike? Yeah, I have no objection. Uh, I also uh, am comforted by knowing that they'll be back before the board to look at uh, any uh, any further ideas they might have for developing the property. But in and of itself, changing it to a residential use is no issues. Sure. Thank you. Likewise, I'm I'm good with this. Um, as Ms. Aguas mentioned, this will come back to us to the planning board for any further any further uh, action here. Um, and I do appreciate the, the effort that was made to reach out to some of the other neighboring owners to ensure that we tried to do this as comprehensively as possible. So with that, um, I think we can feel safe saying that we're sending a very positive advisory opinion on this. Okay. Right. Thank you. The next item, number five. Stanley and Nancy Bailey request an advisory opinion of a miscellaneous appeal application to the Board of Appeals for 165 Pine Point Road, Assessor's Map R68, Lot 6B. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This, because the Bailey Seafood Restaurant is um, a non-conforming use, it's a commercial use located in a residential zone, it's coming to you uh, as the Planning Board for an advisory opinion before the Zoning Board of Appeals conducts a miscellaneous appeal. When you expand or change a non-conforming use, the Zoning Board of Appeals needs to consider that and approve that um, before additional action. So this first step is to um, have get your opinion around this review and this expansion to the non-conforming use. This is actually a, a bit of an after-the-fact review. Um, <coughs> this site was actually reviewed by the Planning Board a few years ago. There was consideration for a pretty major addition, and that got um, delayed or moved forward. And it turns out the applicant put in some, um, some pad areas, uh, expanded the parking to some degree, and added some services, electrical sewer type services, out to that pad area without permitting. So this has been a violation that we've been wanting to kind of get addressed, and the applicant's here to report to the planning board and ultimately zoning board on what the intentions are for the pad area and to kind of get back into conformance and um, move forward. So that's um, essentially where the project stands. Um, a few of the staff <coughs> comments are, you know, if the electrical and sewer services aren't going to be used for the time being, just making sure they're um, capped and, and left in proper condition uh, for not being used. And then another question um, to be figured out now or at the zoning board level is kind of the quantity of impervious paved area that was added and uh, what that means in terms of stormwater, what that means in terms of um, the expansion of impervious area on the site. So those are a few staff questions we had of the applicant um, before we move forward. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. And I'll turn over to Mr. Frank, representing the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, my name is Sean Frank. I'm a civil engineer with uh, Sebago Technics. Uh, I am here on behalf of uh, uh, Stan and Nancy Bailey. Um, as, as Dan gave an excellent little overview there, uh, it started a couple of years ago. They were actually looking at doing a building addition to the restaurant uh, and some other upgrades, if you will, to the site. Um, 
issues came up again what happens obviously you have an, an older bil building an older facility if you will um, in terms of parking and how that related to the roadway and there were just a lot of things and I think that that kind of led them to back off uh, from that proposal that time uh, but they did intend to take the area that I think it had historically been used for the picnic tables down through there and again I'm not real familiar with it but uh, my understanding is it always had outside picnic tables next to the parking lot over there so people could uh, uh, order their meals and go and sit down outside of the facility itself uh, they were actually proposing to enclose that and part of that enclosure was actually going to be the cooking of lobsters if you will so almost like a little kitchen ad area and then the the picnic tables if you will uh, so they did install the concrete pad uh, they did install utilities and they did pave the area uh, which would have the seating as well as uh, 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 the locations for uh, actually putting the post if you will for the uh, for the the seasonal tent that goes out over the picnic tables uh, got the notice of violation um, I think at that time when they first got it their intent was to perhaps go forward with the, the whole the original plan if you will which was the enclosure uh, to do the cooking of the lobsters but uh, uh, the Baileys have had some uh, health issues as of last year and I think at this point in time they're convinced that at least for them um, they would just ask for a, an after the fact conditional approval for the expansion uh, the sewer actually does not come up through the concrete so the cap is actually under the concrete pad itself so you'd actually have to do some work to get that uh, the water is right there next to the concrete but it was never actually connected to the building uh, so there is no actual service there there is electrical service but I again my understanding is that electrical services has been there in the past so um, the area of, of impervious is is highlighted on the plan in terms of yellow which is a, a pavement and uh, the orange which is the concrete pad uh, it adds up to a total of about 4,500 square feet um, which is, is certainly not a large number from a, a stormwater management standpoint I was out there walking this evening and there is no formal stormwater management if you will that all kind of pitches away from Old Blue Point Road and eventually kind of works its way down to the culvert along uh, uh, Pine Point Road um, and again I certainly see that was what was happening in the past I certainly see that as what's happening as of today as well um, we have reviewed obviously the uh, the criteria um, you know again my understanding was this area has always been used or at least for a long time had been used for outdoor picnicking uh, so that really doesn't change it's just the fact that obviously we do have additional impervious area there um, the applicant wanted me to certainly uh, uh, state to the board that they understand that if any other changes occur out here if they do want to use it for a more intensive type of use so they would have to come back to the to this board for that review uh, but like I said they would at this point in time just ask to uh, uh, to allow the use for picnic tables and like I say as we review the criteria we really didn't see it having any impact if you will on the neighborhood in terms of hours of operation in terms of a major expansion associated with anything to the building to the operation uh, to all those types of things so uh, with that mr. chairman I'd conclude my presentation and so would be happy to answer any questions the board may have thank you Great. very much thank you uh, first we do have the opportunity for public comments this is the first time this has been before us in this forum so if anyone's so inclined come on up all right seeing none how about you Mike so if, uh, am I correct in saying that had they not poured a concrete pad or paved the area there would be no violation mm -hmm. Uh, yeah I think it was and again I, I think it was obvious they saw the the utilities going in they saw a concrete pad going down and and again I, the Baileys want to be perfectly clear I mean it was their intent I don't you know obviously they didn't understand the the permitting part but it was their intent to enclose that whole thing at, at, at least enclose you know that area if you will so they could actually have the cooking of lobsters so certainly at least from talking to the code enforcement officer he saw that as an expansion of the business if you will and again sure. I, I don't think you can argue that point uh, uh, from what the original proposal from was. the original intent but what what's before us really now is hard is just barely meeting that criteria I would I would suggest uh, right, with the exception of there they are also asking to erect a tent seasonally uh, yeah, yes it is it's, again <laughs> as, as part of the pavement area uh, that's right next to here they actually have the you know the uh, the supports within the pavement um, and my again my understanding is that they've erected that seasonally for a number of years they have already. Um, mm -hmm. 
and like I said, this just gives it more support or, or more firm support. But uh, you're right. I mean, I think in terms of the proposed use, uh, I think it's it's rather minimal in terms of the fact that it's it's been pretty much used for seating in the in the past, and that's what we're asking for in the future. Certainly, I can see from the town's standpoint, again, certainly from the code enforcement officer's standpoint, you know, sure. the need that this really should have come through prior to the work being done. Now, I heard you when you spoke about uh, the sewer and water not being used, but the electrical would probably be used, would you not? Yes, like yes, and again, my understanding was the electrical was used, and I think it was more for, like, the lighting underneath the tent and that type sure. of thing, so. Um, but again, the hours of operation, whatever they have been, uh, uh, no change. is no change associated with that. The days and the hours stay the same. Um, and again, it has been my understanding that electricity was there. This is just more formal on the ground through conduit uh, to the pad. Well, it seems to me that this actually enhances the use in many ways, uh, including the safety of the pedestrians, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm in favor of forward in a favorable opinion. Thank Thanks, Mike. Nick? <coughs> Excuse me. They had 15 picnic tables. Is that what I read correctly? Yes, yeah, approximately. Yes, I do. <coughs> is that an increase or a decrease? No, or? that's my understanding is it's the exact same number of tables they always had out there. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have much else to add other than, then, you know, I'm okay with it. Next time around, you know, we don't think we all learn something, right? They, we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, history can be a great teacher. All right, thank you. Ron? Yeah, I do have a couple of comments. Um, I'm sorry about the health problems, I really am. However, Sean, they came before us because they, um, a year, year and a half ago. Yes. Uh, because they wanted to do some expansion upstairs and, and so forth and so on, as well as downstairs. So they were well aware that what the sentiments of the board was at that time. Uh, we had some uh, safety problems between there and across the way with the ice cream parlor and everything else. And uh, so we, we expressed, I think, very, very openly and uh, uh, very clearly uh, what our concerns were about the utilization of that particular piece of, of property. Um, so I'm not saying that I'm against going forward because it's after the fact, but it does leave a little bit of a bitter feeling in my system where we had an open discussion where this always discussed about the property, the use of the property, the expansion of the property, the problems with pedestrian flow, and, and so forth and so on. And the, that one aspect, I, I, I'm not sure there was 15 actual picnic tables out there. I may be wrong, and, and, and but I, that seems to be that seems to be a large number in comparison to what I remember. And again, I, I, I'd have to go back to my minutes to to know the exact number. Um, but there is still concern on my part about flow of traffic, parking, and the interplay between the restaurant and the ice cream place across the way. Um, the pad's there, and so be it. Uh, and I echo what Nick just said, that uh, going forward, I mean, uh, we're here to do a job, good, bad, or indifferent. And uh, when we give advice, um, I don't expect somebody to just disregard uh, our input. Um, with that, enough said. Sure. Thanks, Ron. Susan? I have no problem with bringing this, um, of voting yes in favor of this, but I also have to agree with Ron in that <clears throat> I hope a lesson has been learned in that we pay close attention to what's brought to us and um, hopefully any move from here on in to change anything else isn't going to happen without coming here first. I'm not asking for, I'm just saying that's my uh, opinion. My, 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 my thoughts would be is that they are understanding that now is that now. the board would be much less sympathetic if they came back at <laughs> some point in the I future. I think that's probably a safe thing to say. In the meantime, I'm okay with it. Thanks, Susan. Roger? Um, well, I would echo the same thing as Sue and Ron regarding the um, their permitting uh, situation. Um, but I, as far as I can see, what they're trying to do right now, even though it's an after the fact, that they're basically putting a, uh, a pad underneath the picnic tables. 
Yes. Okay. Which have been there for quite some time. That's my understanding. Yes. Um, so I I don't have a problem with what they're trying to do right now, but I I do echo what Ron and, and Sue were saying. So I, and I think based on what you're saying, they understand that. I, that is, I do believe. And they hopefully, do. we won't see something else popping up. I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Um. Sean, can you talk about whether or not there was any grading change as a result of the pad? If it was, it seems to have been very minimal <coughs> because as you look at it, it's it, they added a little additional pavement right there to the edges of the parking, and then I would say that certainly they probably raised the pad itself just a little bit, but it certainly seems to have, have kind of tied, if you will, pretty much into the natural topography. Right off the back of the pavement, you're right okay. back to natural grade again. And the stormwater flows off that, that portion of the site how? Kind of generally, if I can. It kind of all kind of works its way down this way mm -hmm. and eventually kind of works its way underneath. But it's, it's oh, that's right, because you're starting to go up a hill. So yes, it you back are. It's, the marsh that way. It's, it's, okay. And it's not real well defined, at least. And again, I wasn't out there when it was raining. I was just kind of walking there this evening. Okay. Um, but there seems to be general pitch, if you will, towards, towards Pine Point Road. Okay. Um, I guess I have a question for staff at this point. Um, what are the consequences if this is not approved? If it's not approved by the zoning board, um, there would have to be some consideration for a removal of the pad that went in. Okay. And um, in the staff comments, it said um, that uh, the amount of additional pavement impervious should be calculated and provided to the town. Is that done yet? Has that uh, been yes, done that yet? was at 4,500 square feet, okay. approximately 4,500 square feet I referenced earlier. Okay. And any requisite stormwater management should be discussed. So, like I say, I, I see it as a rather minimal from a stormwater management standpoint, if you will. Uh, the stormwater obviously goes now where it did then. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously from a, a very specific standpoint, mm -hmm. the fact that you have sure. what maybe was lawn before and now it's, it's pavement, certainly you have an increase, if you will, in the actual runoff, but I still don't see that happening. Yeah, and, an added, and, and an added heat load, too. That's true, yeah. So, um, so, staff, is this in the regulated portion of the town that has a Clean Water Act permit? Is this in the no. MS4 area? Okay. Yeah. Um, I um, would just encourage you all to, you and the Baileys, to talk with staff about how stor stormwater <coughs> management could be mitigated with respect to thermal impacts or any of the like. Um, and I also echo uh, Mr. Mazur and my colleagues to the left as well. Um, that it seems like there was an intent to move forward, and and um, kudos to the to the uh, code enforcement person for bringing it to to your attention. So, thank you, and thank you for being here today and talking about Not it. At all, thank I you. think a compromise is in the works. <laughs> thank you, uh, and yes, thank you, Sean, for uh, sort of laying that all out for us. And I think we understand that you were sort of called in. From the bullpen here to, <laughs> <laughs> to help clean this up. I hope we do better than um, the socks. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think on the on the merits, I'm I'm with my my colleagues on this, in, in, in the sense of feeling that it's you know it's sort of somewhat more formalizing and cleaning up some a condition that's been there, and so it still fits within the parameters of the non-conforming use, <coughs> in my mind. Uh, if we're starting with the premise that 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 was the use that was already happening anyway, and we can maybe quibble over how many picnic tables there were, but I think generally speaking, um, we're not really talking about a change in the type or intensity of use, so I don't really have an issue with that. Um, and not to belabor it too much, but I you know I have the same sentiment as my my fellow board members in terms of the after of the fact that we're doing this after the fact. And I would just add that. Um, you know, uh, this isn't a case where we're talking about just like a private landowner who maybe was ignorant of the of the uh, of the process. I mean, this is this is a business owner who had been directly engaged with planning staff and the planning board. So, I certainly should have been aware uh, of, if not right off, what the regulations were, but at, at least the fact that there would be some uh, there would be a, a process there. So, again, not to labor it too much, but I think we made that point, and I think we're sending forward a positive opinion to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Mr. Chairman, I just had a thought, if that's okay. Sure. Sean, will there be any um, 
any kind of demarcation between the, the front of the parking spaces and the uh, the pads? Any kind of break? Uh, there's a there's a curb stop there. They actually have curb stops at the at the within the parking lot, the the spaces themselves. Okay. All right. You know the concrete individual concrete curb stops. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else we need to know on this one, Dan? No. For now? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, we thank you for your time tonight. We appreciate it. Item number six, Alpha Management Corp. requests a site plan <coughs> amendment review for 255 U.S. Route 1, Arlberg Ski and Surf Shop, Assessor's Map, U44, Lot 2. Dan? Uh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. This is a roughly a 500 square foot addition proposed to the Arlberg Ski and Surf Shop on Route 1 uh, next to Walgreens. And in your packages, the board and applicants should have um, staff comments and in there we you know it's not a lot of route one frontage but it, if it's possible to sneak in strategically a few street trees uh, staff raised that as a encouragement um, consistent with most properties along route one to, to try to soften the edge of the property um, other than that um, under storm water there wasn't uh, wasn't entirely clear where the roof runoff is being tied into or how it's being tied into the perimeter drains or, or maybe perhaps where the perimeter drains an existing building tie into the stormwater system. So clarity around that would be useful from staff's perspective and also just adding some erosion and sedimentation control nodes to the plan. It's a fairly minor addition, but that's important in, in all locations um, to have containment of construction sites. So um, that's really what we have at the staff level and um, turn it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Dan. And I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Berg. I'm the uh, uh, representative for Alpha Management and Oak Hill Holdings, the property owner. We're here on behalf of our tenant, Alberg Ski Shop. Um, I'm joined by Kevin Dowling tonight from Garon Perrigan Architects. He'll go over the specifics of the plan. But in summary, as Dan said, it's um, a 500 square foot, roughly, I think it's 480 square foot addition, um, strictly for storage use to the Allberg Ski Shop. Um, access is through a controlled door, so it's not for the public. Um, when they get their large shipments of skis, and um, they're doing a lot of paddle boards these days, which are like 10, 12 feet long boards, they have really no room in their building to store them. Um, all the product is brought into their Freeport store and then transferred down here, so it's not big deliveries of these, but when they bring them down, there, they need a place to keep these things. Um, and so that's what the impetus for this uh, um, project is here. Um, Kevin can go over all the specifics of the design and um, layout for the property. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Steve and the chairman have <coughs> accurately described the scope of the project. It's a very small building addition, uh, completely storage. As uh, Steve mentioned, it's almost entirely for the phenomenon for paddle boards. You've probably seen them stacked out there. They're ginormous, and there's nowhere to put them. Um, with regards to the specific design of the structure, the new proposed structure, uh, the finished floor will be set four feet below what the uh, finished floor is of the existing structure. There will be an internal stair, uh, and there will be one door in between uh, to allow, allow access, uh, and then a door, one door facing 27 Gorham Road uh, away from Route 1 will be the main access point for loading things in and out. Uh, the exterior of the building uh, will have the same uh, same cladding, same a similar window pattern. We are proposing a couple awnings also to try and tie in with the old building. Uh, we do have it offset two feet. It might be slightly less than that uh, from the face of the uh, existing building, also to create a shadow line and add a little more interest rather than one flat facade along the uh, facing Route 1. With regards to landscape and plantings, uh, so far we are only uh, proposing a modest 
um, uh, planting around the proposed structure, shrubs, perennials. We are removing one significant tree and we do plan to replace that in the uh, remaining parking island. Uh, one of the real sticking points was the uh, impervious surface for the area. Uh, existing, the existing conditions already put uh, the site uh, not in conformance with the maximum impervious surface allowed. Uh, so that being said, anything that we added, we had to subtract from someplace else. So we subtracted it from the, as you enter the parking lot, right on the right-hand side, we're going to take a sliver of the pavement off of that right near McDonald's, between McDonald's, make that a, a thicker lawn area. And then we're also proposing taking some of the pavement out back where the <laughs> some of the service accesses are to the back of 27 Gorham Road, if that makes sense. The very end, end of that service area, we're going to leave a five-foot swath so that the doors still have a paved path to them, but and rather than have a full access, uh, you know, full vehicular access uh, lane back there, the very end of it will be chopped off. Uh, we, we do have uh, some drainage detailing going on. Uh, we have prepared a fine grading plan. With regards to the stormwater, we have, uh, upon further review, looked at the, uh, the existing building. We don't believe there is a foundation drain there, uh, considering its age and looking at some of the existing infrastructure that's around that uh, structure, that building. Um, so we will, are not going to propose to have a footing drain around the proposed uh, addition. That being said, we still are increasing the stormwater and we are going to have uh, a rather extensive uh, drip edge. Uh, it will be a, also a planted medium at the top, the top surface of it uh, around the back area. We have two different sections there in the detail sheet. Um, but with regards to stormwater, the pre and post uh, conditions are almost essentially the same. Everything from that area flows, sheet flows either into a landscape bed or down into Route 1 and into the stormwater uh, basin between McDonald's and Arlberg. Uh, with regards to the erosion, control, erosion and sediment control notes, we certainly will add that to our plans as requested. With regards to the lighting, uh, we are proposing right now one wall sconce above the entrance slash exit, the e egress door. Uh, it's in the location that seemed like it was being questioned whether or not it was safe due to being well lit or not. Um, we, we don't have photometrics for it. We don't have a fixture picked out yet, but we certainly do have a wall sconce uh, in mind uh, in that location. And with regards to the street trees, uh, there certainly are no street trees in that section. Uh, at this time, we were not planning on putting any there. Um, that being said, there is some room there and we will do what we have to to comply with the board's requests in this regard. Um, and with that, I uh, turn it over to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is another item where we have the opportunity for public comment if anyone's interested. <coughs> All right. Once again, seeing none, we'll go back to the board. Uh, Robin, <coughs> would you like to start off this one? Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I did notice in staff comments that if the board agrees, the staff recommends that a note be added to the plan stating the intended use of the space and that any change of the use of the addition would require a site plan amendment. I would definitely support that. Um, talking about the, the what you call the slice of lawn that you're being that's being added kind of a thing to, to basically mitigate the impervious cover. Um, will that be raised lawn or is there any opportunity to sink to sink that and do maybe a rain garden or something similar? There's, there's certainly a, an opportunity there. Or is uh, this where the well, trees might go? 
It, it certainly could be where at least one or several of the trees could go. It, okay. I'm not sure I would, yeah, okay, let me do one thing. <laughs> With regards to the rain garden, I'm not sure you'd capture a lot of water there. It seems like it, it the water's not going to go there. Uh, it's gonna, it might hit the bottom part, but it, with regards to a rain garden, I, I don't see that as a particularly good use of it. But Let me look at the drainage again. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. <coughs> that, that sliver of land also contains a lot of the utilities running in from Route 1. The uh, water line runs right there. So a tree and wouldn't go there? <laughs> no. Not okay. Well. Um, do you have any subsurface information, like how, how deep below the ground surface the utilities are at that point? The electrical is um, probably the shallowest. The water's down probably four or five feet down. But again, as Kevin mentioned, the way the water flows there, it runs directly down towards Route 1. It doesn't, the way the pave, existing pavement is, and even removing some of the pavement, mm -hmm. it wouldn't, the water would not be running over and, okay. the, you know, towards McDonald's. And so uh, the perimeter drain for the addition has been noted as connecting to the existing building drains. Can you yeah, point out where the... that's an inaccurate comment. Um, there is, there's no perimeter drains on the existing building. Um, there's the building next door has gutters on it, but the Allberg Ski Shop does not have any gutters and there's no perimeter drains for the building. Okay. Could you um, talk a little bit, maybe, do you have a grading plan here where you could talk a little bit about uh, drainage and, and, and runoff? There's run on from Gorham Road that that's surfacing well, right there. This address is Gorham Road, okay. not actual Gorham Road. This yeah. property, 27 Gorham Road, right? Uh, so yeah, almost pretty much all the water here either flows into this landscape bed right now or down right out into Route One. Okay, and so what the 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 dark that the dark um, square is where you're proposing to build. This is the building. This okay. Is the post structure. So you're going to work with staff to develop your erosion control measures there as, as you start building so that we do prevent, like, in the event of rain and the like? Absolutely. We okay. will have a standard kind of, at least a standard and specific uh, erosion control and no two details. So okay. But yes, there was some confusion with regards to the perimeter drain. Initially, we showed one. It's a standard thing that we like to do when we can. 99% of the time, we have footing drains. So relative to that new proposed area, where is that slice you're talking about between Arlberg and McDonald's? Yeah. The slice is here. This is McDonald's over here. Yep. McDonald's. There's a slice here that we want to take. And then the other part that I was describing, back here in the service area, you leave a, a five foot path to get here, and we're eliminating the rest of the metal patch chunk. Okay, so that's the building like where uh, Oak Hill dry cleaners and yes, those are. Exactly. Okay. Um, okay. I, I still see a rain garden or some other type of um, feature there possible but I'll, I'll leave it up to you and the town to deal with the stormwater management. I, I certainly staff. think you can landscape it, but mm -hmm. I just don't, in terms of a rain garden, I just not much benefit of it. So. Every little bit helps. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Thanks. Roger? <laughs> um, a actually, I, I think the addition looks really 
really good. And um, I think it adds quite a bit, especially when I look at the um, what's there right now. It, I think it's a big improvement for for a little structure. Um, and I think the landscaping that you're proposing looks looks fine as well. Um, this was a this was a high school at one time, the original building, right? No. I don't think it was, it was the elementary school. school. Okay. I went to right. kindergarten, first and second grade. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and wide review. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I yeah, I really don't have anything else to add. I think I think it looks good. Thanks, Roger. Susan, anything else beyond that little piece of trivia? Little piece of trivia. That was good. I know. I can always be counted on the trivia. Have you been to a reunion? Reunion. I don't go to high school reunion. Um, okay, just a quick question. Uh, a quick point about the lighting. Um, there was a note that says that the police department questioned whether there was adequate lighting in what's going to become an alleyway, and right. is that where it's going? Yeah. Um, Hopefully you can hear me over here. Um, this area right between the existing buildings, mm -hmm. there's an existing little alleyway here. Mm -hmm. There'll be further, maybe more of a cove, you know, there'll still be a walkway between the two. There's separation between the two buildings. So not only is the back um, of the, the proposed building going to have um, the sconce over the doorway, but we there's lighting actually underneath this office. You can't really see it. It's almost a covered walkway. Okay, that's um, why I was asking. Right. Um, but there's existing lighting in there, and we can further enhance it a bit. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that it was going to be lit because that was one of my my first thoughts when I got yeah. this was to go and take a look at what impact this was going to have on the building that's already there, yeah. and it looks like it's not going to have a major impact. No, it, it's not going to flat wall and um, it's going to cover any windows. Not no, it won't. It um, won't. I was concerned we so. had to. There's a so. stairwell in the front that yeah. doesn't have windows. Okay, has skylights and they'll still and get the, the light. The pedestrian walkways will remain the same. Yeah. yeah, seems fine. Um, I have no idea what an awesome sinewy bark muscle wood is, but I trust that it's going to be a fine replacement for that great tree that's going to be taken down. It's a beautiful tree okay. uh, that's being taken down, and yes, we're going to replace it with a beautiful With a wall. lovely tree, large enough that we'll be able to notice quite quickly. That well, it's two and a half inch caliber minimum, I think. Okay, there you go. Um, the only other thing I want to say is that I really would encourage the street tree part. You know, I mean, this has been an a important focus for the town for a long time. And short of coming along and telling everybody who doesn't have a street tree, you got to plant a street tree, it's like when we have an opportunity, we say, would you please plant some street trees? So that is a request of mine. That you, and, and staff would be more than happy to work with you on all of that. Um, I understand relocating the existing gas utility and underground line as necessary. I that's, don't have to worry about that. No, that's you'll, a you'll take thing. care of it all. I don't have any problems with this. What I, I think what really sold me on it is that you've done such a great job of integrating the architecture of the small addition into what's already there. And then because I get a chance, why, why do I come here every week, every couple times a month? Because I get to say things like, if I had my brothers, we'd take that sign down. But you're not making enough changes to give me an opportunity to say that. So, in the meantime, I think it looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Well, I'm just going to echo what she said. I think that they've integrated everything from the uh, design to the stormwater. It's a small area, and I think that uh, they're trying to do the best they can with the space that's been allocated. I'm okay with it. All right. Thanks. <coughs> Nick? I, too, am okay with what I'm seeing here. I agree with Sue, though, that I think a street tree would be a benefit. I think it's in a similar vein where Route One's that corridor, and we look at signage, and any chance we have a chance to possibly encourage a business to change signage over to make it more appealing, we take it. And I think, uh, I think this tree in this circumstance is something I'd like to see as well. Thank you. Mike? Thanks. Um, is is 27 Gorm Road and 225, is it under the same ownership? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the same lot. Uh, okay. 225 is the existing school. 27 does front on Route 1, but all the main entrances are on, on Gorm Road. And, and all these, I'm looking at um, 
sheet title landscape plans where it talks about existing impervious, et cetera, et cetera, and, and parking spaces. Is that incorporating the whole lot or is that just talking about the scheme? That is that particular lot as defined uh, on the tax map right now. Um, yeah. Um, and, and for staff, I'm curious, why if, if, uh, if the use changes, <clears throat> or maybe you can tell me what exactly you mean by the use of this structure, right. they would have to come back. The, and we have a, a draft motion for the board to consider at the right time where we added an, um, a condition that the applicant uh, administrative review with staff whether they have to come back to the board okay. but there could be a use change where they convert it into uh, retail space or another space that might have a traffic implication right now it's it's warehousing of merchandise where they're already getting deliveries they already have paddle boards so it's not inducing more traffic but there could be a slight increase mm -hmm. in traffic with the retail that being retail sales area, it may not have any effect, and we wouldn't want them to come to the board if it doesn't. But at least a check-in with staff to see if it does is okay. is the important point. All right, thanks. Um, where where would this street tree if planted? Where would it go exactly? Where are the options? <laughs> Very limited. <laughs> the the options are infinite along this section of road, and to some degree along here. As Steve mentioned, there are lots of utilities uh, above ground and below ground through here. No, we want it on Route 1. <laughs> but, yeah, along, along the Esplanade here, I mean, that's where you guys want them. I mean, <laughs> every 35, 40 feet. You wouldn't want to put it in front of the sign. You wouldn't want to put it both. Please. You might want to put it directly in front of the sign. I would actually say that. The sign doesn't say turn yeah. one this way. You really might mm. want to put your tree right in front of the sign. Okay. Uh, All right. I, I too would uh, would suggest that uh, where where uh, where it's most appropriate to plant a street tree or two. Uh, and I too uh, would like to say thank you for incorporating the addition so well with the existing building. I like the fact that you've set it back a little bit also, and it just makes it much more pleasing um, to the eye. So uh, appreciate your hard work on this, and I have no issues. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I too am generally pleased with this. I, to build on what Mike just said, I, I appreciate the, the attention to detail and the thoughtfulness on the architecture, even though it's a small addition, the fact that you've offset it a little bit to provide a little bit more interest. Um, would have been easy to just kind of slap something right on there, um, very vanilla, and I think it'll blend in well. Um, one question I have on the, the light fixture that we're talking about, can you confirm that'll be full cutoff? I can I can confirm that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, we talked about erosion, sediment control, uh, stormwater management. Um, we also have uh, some language as a condition in in, uh, in our draft motion of approval here that will that will address that. Um, and I too am, am in, fa in favor of um, you know being reasonably opportunistic as we like to be on on these sorts of things. Uh, uh, for the street trees, so um, I'd like to uh, include that in our in our approval as well. Um, with that, I would like to put forward a motion. I move to approve the application of Arlberg Ski and Surf Shop, represented by Garin Turgeon Architects, for a site plan amendment reviewed under Chapter 405B, Site Plan Review Ordinance, with the following findings and conditions. Findings as stated herein, I will not read all that but it will be in the record. The following conditions, number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall finalize the plan and submission updates to add erosion and sedimentation control provisions and notes. Number two, a note shall be added to the plan that indicates any change in use of the 480 square foot addition will require administrative review to determine whether further planning board site plan review and approval is necessary. And number three, the applicant shall work with staff on adding street trees to the site plan. I'll second. Yes. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? I, I'm sorry. I think uh, his his gasp was probably it was my trees or tree, multiple. 
What was that? I'm sorry, I didn't Trees read. or trees? Yeah. Trees with an S. That's, yeah, that was his gasp, and it was my first thought, which is... Trees with an S. Trees. I think that's part of what we're, we're at least what is proposed here to be left to staff. I don't think that we're okay. requiring any specific number. It's a mat we have a plan. We have a street tree plan. And it's not a, something that is easily understood unless you know exactly how many feet and so on and so on. But staff understands all of that and will make sure that it falls under the umbrella of what is appropriate and what's not. I think, I think, I think there's only a few locations anyway, so I don't think we're going to be wrestling over six to eight trees. I think we're going to be <laughs> talking about one or is two. it one or two okay. or, you know, All right. in that. Those who are being yeah. burdensome at their feet, oh. I can say. I get my question. <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right, so we have a seconded motion. Any other discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Item number seven, Carmen Chapman's request a sketch mm -hmm. plan review for proposed subdivision at 34 New Road, Assessor's Map R35, Lot 17. Dan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a uh, sketch plan for a proposed subdivision off of New Road. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting site in that it's a lot of acreage, but it's also there's a lot of constraints on the property. There's a fair amount of wetlands and I'm sure uh, Mr. Allen would get into the history of the property, but it, there's some man-made ponds that um, take up a fair amount of space. So it's an interesting property in terms of laying out a subdivision. It's in the, the rural district um, where conservation subdivisions are required when there's a presence of wetlands. So they're, they're certainly required in this case. And um, that section of the ordinance really promotes wetlands to be in common open space, as the board knows, and lots clustered away from them. And also emphasizes avoiding filling wetlands when at all possible. So with um, at the sketch, sketch plan stage, it's really a key time to try to decide, OK, where are the best access points to the upland? Um, how is the property being accessed, and where are the lots being laid out? Um, in addition, and I see there's a map of the Red Brook watershed um, up before you. It's it's also a property located in the Red Brook watershed, which is the town's really priority watershed in terms of our restoration efforts. It's one of our urban impaired watersheds. So um, we have a management plan that's been in, in existence for um, four or five years now around how we restore the watershed, and part of that involves kind of preservation of headwaters, and, and this property has some headwaters uh, in terms of some wetlands and ponds that are feeding down to Red Brook. So another consideration in terms of, you know, how to best lay out the subdivision to kind of buffer the tributary streams and enable it to be developed in a way that's not, um, that's not compromising Red Brook or, or our efforts um, to restore the stream. Um, so. That's kind of the, the background around you know, the regulations that may be dictating how exactly um, development is laid out on the property. Um, another piece of this is kind of lot frontage for the various lots. There's a remaining piece of land that in the sketch plans laid out was inadequate frontage given how it was um, configured. So there could be an opportunity for giving frontage to that uh, larger piece of property through you know, a different road configuration or a future road configuration. So um, I think there's a, a fair amount to, to think about with this one, and, you know, it might be a, a project worth doing a site walk on, and that's a board consideration, but often with, you know, rural properties like that, the board in the past has done site walks to gain a better appreciation of, um, you know, what the lay of the land and, and how best to, to lay it out. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Allen. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Lee Allen with Northeast Civil Solutions. <coughs> I'm joined tonight by the owners of the property, uh, Mr. Jay Chapmas and his wife, Mrs. Carmen Chapmas. Uh, as Dan had mentioned, we are located in the Red Brook watershed. 
Our property is about 60 acres. Mm -hmm. And we're located right in this section right in here. So really a tributary, unnamed tributary stream to Red Brook, our property is committing to. So we are proposing six conservation, required conservation subdivision lots accessed off of a private way approximately 1,200 feet long off of New Road in this area. This, this segment of the property is what we're proposing to be located in that conservation subdivision. We're proposing to keep this property as the homestead lot. This is where the house and the, the Chapmanses live presently. That's to remain. This piece right here is a proposed out sale, which would meet the base zoning, the RF zoning, so it would be more than two acres in size and get, get its frontage off of New Road. The site contains all these, these blue spots here are dug ponds. Those ponds were dug in the 1950s and were used as gravel extraction pits. That gravel was in turn used to construct I-95 and portions of I-295. So back then there was no regulations water table, they just kept digging while the, it was good and they dug below the water table and hence they, they filled up on their own. So all of this land, we've had um, Jim Logan out there looking at this soils, taking test pits everywhere. He's saying the entire site at one point, probably in the 40s, 50s, 60s, was disturbed and has been left since that time and has kind of evolved into what you see now, which is these dug ponds um, there's outlets to these ponds that were dug channels that are now streams. Um, of definition, this is the only stream on the property. What you can't see is this little gap right here. It's actually a culvert that acts as the overflow for this pond. And if you look, these are very straight angles for a pond. It typically wouldn't be that straight, but it was a dug pond. is now classified by the DEP as a stream. <coughs> One of the I don't want to say requirement, but one of the goals of the Red Brook Water District is to avoid stream crossings where possible. So although we have impacted some wetlands along the way to get into the site, we have not crossed the stream or impacted the stream. And in fact, what this yellow line here shows is a 75-foot buffer on either side of that stream uh, that we're proposing to maintain. The road to access these six lots, we're proposing for it to be a private way. Uh, typically the standards of a private way are to be a gravel road, slightly narrower and uh, um, not as built to as strict a standard as a town road. Um, what we're proposing is actually to build the first 700 feet out of the 1,200 feet with pavement and curbing. That is for a number of reasons. Um, the first and most important is to capture stormwater runoff so that we can meet um, the DEP water quality rules. Um, this project does need a DEP stormwater permit. It also needs a DEP NRPA Tier 1 wetlands permit. We're impacting approximately 8,000 square feet of, of wetlands. So the first 700 feet will be paved and curbed um, in this upland area right here, which also happens to coincide roughly with the low point of the road. We're going to treat um, our stormwater and underdrain filter pond, uh, which is a best management practice uh, recommended, one of the best management practices recommended by the DEP. The remainder of the road we're showing is gravel. Um, not saying that couldn't be paved down the road, but for right now it's going to be gravel built to town standards. Um, each lot will be served by well and septic. And then this is where it gets really interesting, is that the way to access this and adjacent properties, we, we've looked at another property that's back up in this area. There's potential for this road to be extended one off the end and follow this road back down to New Road. Also where the Hammerhead is, there would be required seam crossing, but there's some, some good land up here. This property up here is actually landlocked. It has no frontage. So that's something it's, it's owned by an estate right now. 
something in the future that could possibly happen where this ex extends out. Um, it's about 1,150 feet here, so that would leave another 850 feet you could extend that road without meeting the maximum length of a dead end road. Just something to think about. There, there's more, more than just this. There, there could be connections. I mean, at some point this could be sold and this road could be moved back around down to new road. With that, I'm sure I've stirred up a, a hundred questions. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to answer them. <laughs> Mike? Uh, Go for it, Mike. I'm a, I'm a little, um, I don't know if confused is the right word, but I, I'm having a hard time wrapping my arms around what, what really is this subdivision. You're saying there's seven lots. The six lots that we see six up lots to the left, and under then we see the standalone lot that you talked about. Is that part of the subdivision, the plan subdivision? So, they're, they've proposed that lot split to split that lot out. Because it's going to happen within five years of this subdivision, it has to be pulled back into this subdivision. That's a state subdivision law. Uh, yeah, yeah, but for the for the um, for the reasons that we're here today, I. I just have a hard time kind of looking at that lot A as a part of of this subdivision. We have this one big lot. And I understand that the uh, remaining lots that, to the Chatmas at, at 46 and change acres. Correct. I understand that piece. This, but but it would be simpler for me to understand that now we're talking about this land area that's going to comprise six lots for for a subdivision. But I don't understand why lot A is actually part of the discussion here. It's because of the state subdivision rule, which said that any lot split out within five years, mm -hmm. whether it's just a lot split, like he could go write the deed, sell that land tomorrow, it still has to be brought in front of the planning board because it still falls under right. subdivision statute. Right, so maybe in the future you'd be before us talking about splitting lot A off. It's already in process. So oh. this has happened first. This has already happened. We're coming in second with the six lots. Oh, so we're not really talking about lot A today. We don't have to be, but we have to, by law, I have to mention that it is part of the subdivision. It's not a six-lot subdivision by law. It's a seven-lot subdivision. Oh. So what do you think about all that, Dan? I mean, can you bring more clarity to it for me? What's this frontage thing? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's perhaps you're thinking about it as a different project in that it's not related to the proposed road, right. but it's all part of the same parcel, and therefore... There's actually eight lots. I mean, if you count right. the existing house yeah. lot, the homestead that, lot. that's a lot as right. well. And so when the board looks at a subdivision, three or more lots being divided, you have the ability to t look at the entire parcel. Um, you may find it acceptable to have a lot, you know, lot A off by on its own and not really co-mingling with the project, but you have the ability to look at that and decide whether that's the best configuration for subdivision on this land. Hmm. Okay. Would you explain, I, not to interrupt, but would you explain the last note on, in terms of that? Which, on the staff, the staff comments? comments? Yeah, staff comments, the last one that talks about the frontage and how, how lot A affects the frontage. Yeah, right now, there's, well, there's, this large property has two areas where it connects to New Road. There's an area down... I guess is that South Flea? Uh, um, <coughs> east and West. Okay, so about. West side is where the proposed road is, mm -hmm. and then the East side is where the driveway for the remaining land um, comes off. There isn't 400 feet of frontage along that East area on its own. Lot A? Well, Lot A is proposed to have 200 feet of frontage, which meets the requirements but then it makes the remaining land have inadequate frontage because that has less than 200 feet of frontage where the driveway is there. Okay. And frontage needs to be counted along a continuous Thank line. You. you can't provide a bits and pieces of frontage to add up to 200 feet um, if it's separated by other properties. So that's the issue around lot A. It's really creating an issue for the existing lot in terms of not having adequate frontage. That, that helps? Yes. Yeah. 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 So where, where are we? Are we back 
Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so it looks like there's, there's an issue with lot, with not with uh, how lot A affects the remaining frontage on the 46 acre lot. Correct. Okay. So I imagine that you're working on some solution for that. We have a couple in mind. Yes. Okay. Um, Are we going to hear about as far as far as the uh, the uh, six lot piece, you you said that. Um, Something that I thought was contrary to my understanding was that a private road does not need to be built to town standard. It, it doesn't, as long as we're serving six lots or less. Being with an eye to the future and thinking towards the future, if this were to be continued around and have more than six lots, in order for that to be a legal subdivision on a public road, that road would have to be built to town standard. So that is why we're looking at building this road above and beyond what a private road standard is in the future, if it goes that way or this way, right. you would need to have the road from there back to New Road to Town Standard. Okay, so I was unaware of that six lot cutoff. Is that a correct interpretation, Dan? That That's correct, lot? but the board, through subdivision review, <coughs> has the ability to right. determine, working with the applicant, what that construction standard is. It doesn't mm -hmm. need to be designed to treat acceptance standards if it's going to be private, but the board needs to be comfortable with the well, construction and emergency response and all the things you typically sure. look at. And other things. I mean, we've seen in the in the last several years where folks on private roads have requested the town to adopt them as town roads. And we all know the challenges that come with that. So, I, you know, I'm a strong proponent, and I know, I know it's, it's money, but, I mean, that aside, it's easy for me to say that, I guess, but that aside... I, I prefer to see private roads built to town standards whenever, whenever it's practical. In this case, it seems to me to even be a better idea because, um, as you pointed out, the, um, the potential to extend this road into undeveloped areas is, is more than great. So, uh, and plus, I don't think, I don't think I've, I've uh, seen a subdivision that's, that's uh, proposed um, several hundred feet maybe being pavement than uh, transition to gravel. Right. I, I think it's more of a, if they decide to pave it, they can. They have the option at least. If we show it all paved and that's the plan that gets approved, there's no option mm -hmm. for future pavement. Okay. Um, anyway, um, at this point, so we have frontage issues. I guess that's, it sounds to me like you're almost prepared to give some sort of answer tonight, but, um, and those are my, uh, those are my uh, points or my opinions on the, on the road that serves the six. Yeah. Um, have you done any test pit analysis? Yes. I'm sure there's plenty of water. There is. And um, the, 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 the hard part was finding passing septic locations, which we were able to do. You were. Okay. We were. All right. All right. I guess that's it. I don't want to dominate the time, but thank you, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Thanks thank you. Mm -hmm. Nick? Okay. Um, I want to make sure I have my facts correct. So we have seven lots. Right. And down the road, a ways, this seventh lot is going to be proposed to be subdivided. Is that what I understood? No, I think it's already in the works. That means that the deed is being written, pens are being set, it could go on the market. You're referring to lot A. Lot A. Uh, I'm sorry, lot A, you correct. Lot I'm talking lot A. Now, the reason I'm, I'm curious about this is it sounds to me like your regulations change if this were a nine-lot subdivision versus a six-lot. Mm. Some of the things that you may have to do, you indicated the if six, six lots or less over here, you could get away with. with that, that's dirt. depending on where the lots get access from. If it's all from that, if say there were seven lots off the private road, you couldn't do that because you can only get six lots off a private road. This lot is getting frontage off an existing road. Okay. It's awkward. That's, what, that's really it's confusing. I, yeah. No, it, it's awkward. I mean, to uh, to see an island out there of of a subdivision per se, just sitting out over here. Never mind the whole. You've lost a little bit of the frontage that you needed on the existing property, but it's it's an awkward proposal. Uh, it's the way I view it, um, from what I can see. The six. I don't have a whole lot of problems with what I'm seeing on the six right now. It's that seventh proposed A lot that is just raising my eyebrows. I don't know how else okay. to say it. It's just 
I, I think the issue I think the issue gets back to the frontage, which I think we're prepared to handle in a number of different ways. Um, one is we could construct the beginnings of the private road that connects back through here, and you'd get the frontage for the remaining lot. Um, that would be all private road. Correct. Unpaved gravel. Yes, correct. Okay. And that's. I mean, I think for right now, that's the extent of, of my comments. Um, Ron. <laughs> Thanks. Ron? Thanks. Um, first of all, before I get into what I, I, I agree with Mike, uh, if it's going to build a road, then I just to see specifications rather than the headache of coming back after the fact. Agreed. But having said that, this is one of those projects I have to see it. I, I, I'm, I'm so confused right now. <laughs> I have to go out and see it like we've done in some other projects because I can't put my arms around this. There's wetlands involved here, there's, there's the river involved here, there's frontage involved here, there's so many variables, dangling variables, that I can't tie together unless I go out and see it. So with that, unless I see it, I have no further comment. Thanks, Ron. Susan? Wow. Okay, I'm going to start with the um, planning staff comments. So well, number one says first step is to provide a re net, the net residential density. Has that been done, staff? They've done a <coughs> calculation. What's also required when you do a conservation subdivision is you show uh, what's called a conventional subdivision, which That's is a wondering. true two-acre subdivision, to show two-acre lots. And um, Lee's indicated that they've done that at, at their office. They haven't provided it to your to staff to look at or the board to look at. So that's a key step to just see that. And if that's not possible, then this whole thing is just dead. That's um, true. But it, we, we did get it to work. Be, yeah. But we haven't seen it. You haven't seen it because by the time we got the memo and we did the work, it was okay. Friday and you don't want to see it at the last minute. A last minute versus nothing <laughs> is probably what I would prefer. Okay. Um, I'm also very concerned about how Lot A is going to work, and I'm looking forward to you showing us how you're going to take care of that because this is definitely not being taken care of. Um, I also am concerned, I live in an area where there are many private roads, and there's a lot of problems with private roads. People think they know what they're getting into when it's a private road, but then when they've lived there a couple of years, they don't really understand exactly what it means to be on a private road. And guess who they call? Mm -hmm. They don't call the developer. They call town hall. Why is my garbage not being picked up? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not a fan of private roads. Definitely not a fan. So to take this and then extend it further on to more houses on private roads it's not something that I am in favor of, but I suppose I can't do much about it. Um, I'm very concerned about the impacts to all the wetland areas, and I'm not sure that this makes me feel a whole lot more comfortable about it. So I don't want to take up time right now, but I need to understand more than I do right now. In fact, it, number two on the... Um, planning staff comment says, as currently designed, the road alignment off New Road impacts five to six wetland areas and what appear to be a few different tributary streams channeled to Red Brook. Is that so being approached? Is that being... So there are no streams there. There are wetlands. There's, there's water seeping out of the slopes here. And I think it would be easier to see in the field. And obviously, if we go out on, it sounds like we're going to go on a site walk, we'd have the soil evaluator there to explain how these wetlands evolved and, and how they're functioning. But the wetlands that we're dealing with, in, in my opinion, relatively low-value wetlands where we're crossing them, we're staying away from the high-value wetland, which is the stream. Where is this in terms of DEP approval at this point? We are about to submit plans to the about DEP. About to submit plans. Okay. Um, the, the crossings to Redbrook, I mean, we can't say it often enough, but it's one of the top priorities for the town, and I certainly hope that this, pr this presentation understands that. Um, and I'm very confused about what you think you're going to do about the frontage. It was given to us this evening by saying that this is 
I've been I've been on the board a long time, and I've never seen anything quite so confusing. <laughs> and um, I'm not dead set against it, but I have a lot more questions than I have answers. So I'm going to leave it at that and move on. Excuse me. Yes. Okay, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Roger? Uh, thanks. Um, I have, actually, I don't have any problems with lots one through six. I tend to agree with Nick on that. They, that looks okay. The only question I have is, can that road be built right there along the property line like that? Sure. A, that's one edge. The property line's one edge of the right of way. If you go 50 feet the other side, that would be the other side okay, of the so right of way. No problem there then. No problem. Okay. Um, I just have some general questions about the overall place here, the area. Um, with where we um, before us uh, previously was another development off of Gorm mm -hmm. Road, a major. I think it was 289. Was it 289 Gorm Road? I think there's two developments in there. You know, the big um, Grandin property? Uh, 299. 299? I think so. Do you have any idea where this falls in yeah. relationship to that? Yeah. I know the other one is right across from the golf course. Yes. Right. So the golf course is right here. Yeah. And their property is right in this area right here. Yeah. We're up in this area. Okay. Because when we're talking about that development, we're talking about a potential road going up to New Road. Would would this property would there be any? Would uh, there make any, sen any sense for this property to have that? We're I think on the other side. We're on. Here's New Road right here. Okay, you're on the other side. We're on the other side. Okay, of okay, road. okay. Yeah, and a, the Grandin property, <coughs> a potential road would be connecting 114 Gorham Road to Running Hill Road. Right, and then on the other side. Not time no. to New Road. No. So Running Hill Road's here. I think that proposal goes straight across right. Running Hill Road up in this area. This one comes off. Right, and it's different. Right. Oh, okay, okay. All right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the the other question I had is. Um, would um, would there be, and this is guess for staff, would there be notes on this if it was approved so that uh, uh, property owners would know that potentially that there's going to be other roads connecting, that these roads could be extended and there may be other developments somewhere along the line? Just so, that, for the purposes, so people don't buy these homes thinking that this is the road that they're going to have and then all of a sudden find out there's going to be another uh, ten homes built somewhere else, and there's going to be a feeder road going right through here. Right. Well, the road right of way, the road layout, would need to provide connections to the abutting properties, and that's done often in town. Um, and that doesn't prevent new homeowners from not liking the road extension no, I understand, in the future. But, but yeah, I mean, it's generally tried plans or. Uh, designed to make it clear that future road connections are possible or are likely, um, and that would be the same case here if that's okay. the design that uh, the board ends up with. It's but it's still still hard to prevent the concern that arises five, ten years down the line. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, then the the other uh, question I have, and it's probably for staff as well, on lot A, I understand that's being carved out right now. Um, but what happens to the remaining? I know you said you're, you're trying to work out something, but is it, is it something like is it grandfathered or anything like that? Can, in other words, if they want to do what they have here, could they do it, or do they have to accommodate the 200-foot frontage? It's already there. I, I think we have to accommodate the remaining land yeah. frontage requirement because yeah. we can't create a non-conforming lot, as well yeah. as address the frontage for the lot A. Okay. Right. So we have to deal with both. And that's something we're working on. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, uh, just uh, my last question, just out of curiosity, did uh, these these uh, owners did they originally own all these properties? Oh, okay. All right. Um, oh, one last question on these um, these man-made ponds. <laughs> Once they're there, are they always considered a natural like a natural pond? Once once it's been Established or that it ever go back to DEP's jurisdiction. Um, the most recent example of a pond like this is the salt pump on Haggis Parkway. Yeah, it was that climbing gym that was approved to build actually 
on the edge of the pond. So in that case, DEP considered that a not a resource, you know, not something that needed um, a buffer or a setback or to be treated like a pond or a wetland. I am not going to hazard a guess on DEP's opinion on, on um, this site. Maybe Lee yeah. knows, but that's yeah. something that we can inquire with them about. What is What are you jurisdictionally considering these? So, so I guess there is Army. Well, and the other thing is that's DEP, and then you have to look at Army Corps. Mm -hmm. um, they'll look at everything, and they don't care whether it's man-made or not. It is uh, considered a wetland. So, but that was not the case on the salt pump. Okay. They agreed that those were man-made ponds, which were exactly. Army <laughs> Corps did too. What? Uh, Correct. DEP, but Army okay. Corps did too. Uh, it hasn't been my experience in all cases, though, with that. Okay. Um. But th this is a slightly different situation where some of, you can notice like this pond right here, we have wetlands surrounding it. So the, the wetlands are jurisdictional surrounding the man-made pond, which makes it a little bit trickier. It's not as clean oh, yeah. cut as it was on the Haggis Parkway. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Thanks. <laughs> um, I don't know where to start. Um, let's start with the road. I think you had mentioned that an underdrain soil filter is. Yeah. Where are you proposing to put it? Right in here. It's a really high water table. You think you're going to have enough hydraulic yes. head? Yes. Um, the private road. I also agree with my colleagues that if if there is some idea, any inkling to extend yeah. this, meet town standards. Yeah, that's that's where we're headed. Um, I do appreciate you putting. The, the lot A on, despite it being confusing, you get the larger common plan of development so you understand what all the triggers are, which brings me to my next question, which is um, what did you say the proposed impact to wetlands was in square footage? It was approximately 8,000. Okay. Um, I feel like that's low. So I think this would be a good site for um, a peer review, uh, especially considering the the importance of the headwaters of Red Brook in this area kind of thing. You're saying a peer review with the wetlands? Yes, with yeah. the wetlands. Sure. Um, in and you mentioned Jim Logan yeah. went up and took a look at that. Yeah. Can you tell us who Jim Logan is? Sure. He was formerly of, not Prince, but he was formerly of uh, Al Frick and Associates. He's now out on his own with a firm called Longview Partners. Okay. And what was he evaluating for? He did all the test pits. He's a okay. soil evaluator and a certified soil scientist. He also did all the delineation for the wetlands. Okay, and so was he the person then who sort of gave you the septic yes. uh, green flag? Because I also have concerns mm -hmm. about, about yep. that. Um, I also have concerns about the application of a conservation sort of uh, subdivision here kind of thing. Um, I think I think we're pushing it to get six lots over here. Like, I think that something c could probably happen, but, but I, I, I let's, let, I'll just leave it at. Um, I think that we really need to keep in mind the the value of of the headwaters of Red Brook in this in this instance, and understand the real sort of hydraulic and hydrology going on up <laughs> here. Um, I also uh, would encourage you to put the conventional subdivision analysis yes. in front of the town um, with the two conventional two-acre lots. Um, uh, I like staff comments where it said we encourage the board and the applicant to help prevent impacts and impairments in new areas of the watershed and let's not forget that this is impaired which means it's not meeting Clean Water Act right. requirements. That, and that's where I think with what we're proposing, what the DEP requires and what we're proposing to do for stormwater treatment would actually be an enhancement here and not a detriment. How, how is it an enhancement? All this water that has been running out of these ponds, is these are all dug channels that, that were coming out of these ponds. We're now going to be collecting that stormwater, treating it before it's discharging off the site. So I think the, the runoff off the site will be cleaner than it, it has been. I'm not sure if I agree with that. But has, have you given any thought to the 75-foot buffer that, that the staff comments sure. have talked about? Yeah, that's right. We're showing that, yep. that yellow line. So that, this is a stream, yep. so we're protecting that, buffering it here. We're preventing any building in here. Okay, so it's like the, the setback pocket on Correct. that northernmost lot. Yeah. You, yeah. We push it okay, down. you push it down. Okay. Um, 
What's the jurisdictional setback for wetlands? Is there any staff? There's a town imposed 25 feet. Yeah, 25 feet. Okay. 25 feet of no disturb, and right. then there's a 15, 15 foot building right. setback to that 25 feet. So to a structure, it's it's 40 feet. So that's you're seeing the 25 feet from to the property line, line, and the 15 feet here. Mm -hmm. um, in other places, we've tried to increase that and, and keep as far away as we could. So on my plan, it's looking like a lot of the green that you have there is, is indicated in um, wetlands. Correct. And But you notice okay. the, the stream above. So so what happened is when we submitted this plan, he hadn't finished doing his wetland delineation. And so these wetlands up at the top of the page here were something he'd just finished um, in the past week. But a above the northernmost lot there, where you said where the 75-foot setback yep. is, and the culvert transmits the overflow from right the pond. Yep. You called that a, a stream, though, a portion of the stream. This is this is considered a stream. And he, when he was back out there, I said you need to look at these and tell me what are streams, what aren't. And he said this definitely is a stream. Said the remainder of the lot, there are no streams. And when you say he, who was Jim it? Logan? It was Jim Logan. Yes. This, so he's a soil scientist, but not a wetland scientist. There are no certified wetland scientists in Maine, only in New Hampshire. But there is a difference. And I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corey. Thank you. One, one quick comment, which I forgot to make. I really want to um, also encourage us to have a site walk on this. Season is right, and this is really something I'm going to have to get my mud boots on and go take a look. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'll start off by picking up on that. I absolutely agree. Um, we, we have had a few other projects that have had somewhat similar challenges in terms of getting our heads around how things are laid out and where things are wet, how things flow, just general proximity type things. So I think it would be a good idea to get our boots on and kind of walk around and you know make sure things are staked out strategically so that there's some frames of reference. Um, I think that would I think that would go quite a ways toward helping us sort of get a feel for this. Um, you know, as Susan said there are more questions than answers right now. That's not all that unusual at sketch stage. Um, it has been helpful to get this background. Um, I think by their nature, these conservation subdivisions, it seems to me more often than not, the first time we see them, they look impossible because <laughs> um, you're just trying to squeeze things in. Um, there's no other way to put it. And um, I think at some point, there, it's hard to say where that line is. I think sometimes it gets beyond that line and it just trying to fit a square peg in a round hole um, and it, you know, that you're doing more potential harm to the resource and possibly creating um, drainage and other water issues for future uh, owners there. I'm not saying that's the case here, but I, those are things we have to think about every time we go into one of these um, just based on past experience. And as has been noted before, we're just based on what's available and more or less buildable in town, um, we're seeing a lot of these proportionately uh, in relation to other types of subdivisions. Um, so I think it's been pretty well established that you know we've, we've got to see um, what your thinking is on <coughs> and, and how you may solve that frontage uh, issue and sort of how that all fits together. Um, I will also echo my my colleagues and and calling for uh, and it sounds like you're already on board with that, uh, having the private roads be up to town standards. Um, you know that the, the DEP process. Um, one thing that I might suggest, and I know that um, Saunders called for, suggested that there be some peer review for wetlands. I'd like to suggest we sort of task staff if they're comfortable with continuing that conversation with the applicant and sort of looking at what, what the options might be. It sounds like the wetland delineation, your own wetland delineation is still kind of a work in progress and just sort of see where we end up with that. Um, but and one thought along similar lines, and we mentioned the, the Grandin project, which obviously is a larger scale. Um, I don't know if this is something that merits having the Conservation Commission take a look at. Um, we, you know, again, it's not a huge project, but given the sensitivity of the Red Brook watershed, um, and the fact that we're trying to work them into into our process, and I think this would be the appropriate stage 
to do it. Um, so I'd like to suggest that, and that's something else that the applicant can discuss with staff and, and circle back as needed on that. Um, and make sure we've covered all the bases. I think we have. Obviously, we'll want to see that conventional plan. Yeah. <laughs> and I understand. I mean, we've generally made clear in the past we don't like to get things at the last second, so I understand that. I understand that um, reasoning. It's good to know that it's been done, and we'll just uh, we'll see that vetted and, and take a look at it ourselves. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I again, it looks daunting, but we've we've gotten there on other other proposals, and we may get there with this as well. We'll just see how it all comes together. Is there anything else you need from us? Just are you if are you going to schedule a site walk as a board? Is that something you're going to do now, or are you going to rely on staff for that? I think we would do what we've typically done uh, and have staff follow up with us offline okay. and coordinate with, with the applicant, obviously, and, and we'll put that together sometime fairly soon. Yeah. I think. And sometimes uh, in the past, the boards decided to do them before regular board meetings, and this time of year, there's enough certainly enough light to do that, um, and. Once in a while, the Conservation Commission meeting schedule collides with the planning board, and I don't know if that's true in May, but that might be not be an opportunity to engage them and invite, you know, get them familiar with the plan in advance, and potentially invite them to the the site walk at the same time. It could be um, a productive way of doing it. So we can right. consider ideas to the board and 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 you, Lee, and coordinate yeah. on that. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Right, thank you. Thank you. Item number eight, 25 Wash LLC requests a site plan amendment review for 25 Washington Avenue, assessor's map R62, lot four. Dan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this was item was before the board, I believe, to your last meeting. Um, they've since updated the plans, and, and just as importantly, they've submitted a companion subdivision plan amendment. That was something that, that wasn't submitted last time that was important to this project. There's some land. Uh, being transferred from the abutter to, to this property owner to move forward with their project. Um, at this point, staff um, generally is satisfied with where the plans are at. Um, stormwater management, there's a few remaining items that need to be reviewed one more time by Water and Current, our, our engineer, but they're, um, they can be handled as a condition um, from, from our perspective. And the only other item that staff recommended is consideration for our dark sky goals and thinking about trying to, uh, I know the applicant doesn't want to do new cutoff pictures around the entire building, but there are shades or um, shields that are, I think, fairly inexpensive and often work for existing wall packs. That's a way to get at updating a site to be consistent with the ordinance requirements for full cutoff fixtures without spending a lot of money. So that's a plug for that idea. But um, other than that, you should have our staff comments on you know, where the project stands, um, as well as Water and Current's review comments. And um, should you get to a point where you want to make a motion, we've prepared one for this application. So at this point, we're fairly satisfied. Thanks, Dan. Before turning it over to the applicant's representative, I'll go slightly out of order and just build on to your little plug there and, and, and just say that at least to my mind, I think part of what we're part of the thought process is that while there are no direct residential abutters there, that you know, every little bit counts when we think about overall light pollution, so to speak. And so anything we can do to try and incrementally um, take opportunities to shield things a little bit, we'd like to try and encourage that. So with that I'll hand it off to you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Bushy with Stantec here on behalf of uh, twenty five Wash LLC. Uh, joining me is uh, Mr. Jesse Abbott, a uh, longtime property owner here uh, in the town. The location, uh, as we outlined here a couple meetings ago for you folks at uh, uh, 25 Washington Avenue in the Industrial Park. So this site plan shows Washington Avenue right on the corner uh, coming in from uh, the Manson Libby side. Public Works is just down to the south of us, and the mainly carting facility is uh, over just to the east of us. 
And uh, the proposal basically is for a parking lot expansion. Uh, they have a parking uh, uh, capacity issue on the property today, and they have some uh, uh, vacant land here just to the east side of the existing building, the building being about uh, just under 20,000 square feet in size. They have an existing parking area here just off of Washington, but some of that is uh, bisected by a loading dock area here. Uh, the tenant is a very busy tenant with a number of employees, so they're interested in, in getting this parking lot expansion. Uh, the expansion will require a transfer of property from the uh, mainly carting uh, property, which is lot seven of the original industrial park, and this is uh, lot four. I'll uh, note here that in the agenda it, it says site plan uh, approval, but we're also here uh, asking for an amended subdivision approval. And as Dan had suggested, you know, we had uh, previously not submitted that amended plan, and we now have made that part of the, the record. So we would hope tonight, if you are to take uh, an action, which we hope you will, uh, we'll be on the subdivision side of things as well. So. Um, so we have that small transfer of land here. We provided you evidence as to what it does for the Lot 7 area. <coughs> Interestingly enough, Lot 7 on uh, just uh, in, in 10 seconds here, Lot 7 had itself had an amended uh, subdivision piece a number of years ago where they took uh, some land from an adjoining piece on the other side of, of their uh, property. So uh, there's been some amount of line shifting, so to speak, on a few of the lots down there, and that's not unusual, I suppose, with uh, various uh, developments that have taken place over the course of the, the, the industrial park's history. So the uh, plan here is for this parking lot, very traditional 90-degree uh, parking layout, uh, single bay, so to speak. We are asking for approvals from you folks to allow what would be two driveway locations. So again, here's the existing driveway off of Washington. And we're asking for a uh, second driveway entrance into the uh, parking lot area here. And given the uh, proximity and use of the loading dock area here, we felt that this was a uh, better and more easier route for access into this uh, employee parking zone here. So we are asking for a waiver from you folks for driveway separation and the number of driveways to the, uh, to the property. And we hope that you will find uh, that uh, the new driveway will not result in any particular undue hazard or uh, uh, traffic congestion, uh, certainly given its proximity here to the very south end of the industrial park, traffic is relatively low. I think the traffic peer uh, consultant has uh, agreed with that idea. A um, couple of the other things I'll point out, particularly on the site plan, and it was an outcome of the comments that we heard from you folks at the last meeting, and that was how access from the parking lot here for those who would be uh, parking their vehicle getting into the building. And we have an existing door here. Primary entrance has always been right over in this location here. Been working with the uh, landowner and the uh, tenants. They've concluded that this door here could be used as that primary entrance. And in fact, by providing a sidewalk along this side, we really avoid what I believe was the comments from you folks about uh, 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 folks having to walk across the loading dock area to get to that access door. So I think we've addressed that in terms of uh, pedestrian safety measure uh, of there being able to, to walk in from the parking lot in that regard. So uh, I'll also note that the building expansion, which we had talked about a little bit, that really, though, is not um, to be made part of this particular approval process tonight. We wanted to, though, let you folks know that there may be, in some point in the future, uh, an opportunity to expand the building there based on the tenant needs, and that's what we're looking at. It's not a very big expansion space, but that could be possible, but uh, we'd have to come back to you folks for an approval in that regard. But it's shown on our drawing uh, still. The other piece to the uh, site plan is the drainage components, and what we've uh, provided is a parking lot that would be drained from the north end down towards the south and uh, crowned in the middle kind of in a traditional manner so that we would have water be able to uh, drain off into an underdrained soil filter field, common BMP practice for uh, water quality treatment off of paved surface. Uh, it's a little tight 
based on vertical grades and so forth, but we can make it work with a field, filter field here and a filter field on the other side. Ultimately, the water drains off into uh, a drainage ditch along Washington. There's a culvert underneath the driveway to, uh, to the uh, neighbor. Water ultimately goes down along the uh, ditch along Washington, crosses back underneath Washington, and goes out behind the public works facility and towards the Willowdale and ultimately uh, the river in, in tidal conditions. So, but we provided uh, calculations and so forth for that. I know that the peer reviewer had provided a few comments about some sizing on things. We feel like we've addressed those. We're certainly happy enough to finalize that up, uh, presumably at a staff level or peer review level. Uh, just some minor tweaks and so forth. A couple uh, comments from the staff with regard to snow and snow plowing and staff's comment about um, protection of these drainage areas so that snow isn't necessarily pushed directly into those, uh, thus potentially clogging them or fouling them up and so forth. We've agreed that we could put uh, uh, a number of boulders on the edges there just to prohibit basically or uh, dissuade any snow plows from uh, pushing snow into there. Uh, we do feel though that the snow plows would uh, effectively just come into the driveway. We do have a couple of zones at the very end here so that makes reasonable sense that they would just push the snow off the end here or similarly as they do today push the snow over on this side. But, you know I'll note that there are some uh, sizable trees along this part of the, uh, the frontage we are proposing uh, a few more tree plantings. <coughs> Here along the front and then along the shared property boundary, you know, we've pointed out that these trees are uh, effectively really on the, the neighbor's property. There's uh, some joint cooperation going here. Obviously, the, the neighbor is uh, a friendly one because they're selling the property uh, to allow the uh, uh, parking lot expansion to take place. And uh, between the two parties, they've agreed that they'd like to see the trees planted uh, just along this edge here would happen to be on the other side. We also note that staff had made a comment about two and a half inch caliper trees, and we're certainly happy enough to uh, provide that as well. Um, so that, given the... Uh, existing very mature trees on this side, number of trees over on the corner here. Uh, we felt that uh, we had hopefully satisfied any degree of landscaping coverage that we would need, particularly in this area of the park. To the uh, comment about the lighting, we've heard that, talked that over with uh, the owner. Uh, we had shown a couple of new lights on this side of the building, and they would be LED cut off brand new fixtures. The existing fixtures identified here on the plan, a little bit more older, traditional, not full cutoff fixtures. And to staff's comment about uh, the potential putting a shield, I talked that over with the owner. He's uh, offered to me that a, a commit commitment from him, uh, perhaps not in the very short term, but certainly as a uh, matter of progress being made. He owns a number of buildings here in the, in the town. As an example, uh, I think it's three commercial road over off of Pleasant Hill Road, he owns a building there, and he's, he's just put in brand new LED cutoff fixtures on that building, and he's committed to beginning to do that on his other buildings. He owns a number of buildings here in town, so he's, he's amenable to doing that. It just may not be exactly this summer uh, as he's building the parking lot, but that is a measure that he's committed to. LEDs, I think most property owners, at least from what I'm gathering, and you folks probably hear more, uh, they're more energy efficient. Uh, they have a upfront cost to them. They're more expensive, but over time you recoup that cost relatively quickly, I believe, with the LET fixtures, and, and they are nice. They're, they're cut off, and uh, the light coverage is uh, widely becoming more accepted as the de facto way to go. Uh, so, you know, that's the plan in place. I think uh, we ask for some leniency, recognizing, you know, as a property owner here, long-standing property owner, he's, he's going to make the commitment to, to doing those. It just... Uh, it's got to take a little time to factor in. There's a cost element. It's got to build this parking lot, and uh, uh, that's not cheap, uh, certainly, but he's making an effort to, uh, to make these things uh, happen, and he feels as though in this particular case, you know, we've got a, uh, got a good tenant, and uh, they're very busy. They've got a uh, good workforce. He wants to provide, you know, ample parking for them and uh, doing well by the building. So 
um, that's where we stand. We're hopeful that uh, you folks will uh, take a positive action tonight for both the site plan and the uh, amended subdivision plan. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Susan, you want to start? Sure. Thank you. Um, it looks like most of the concerns from the uh, staff comments have been addressed. Uh, the subdivision amendment, and I would assume that anything that we offer tonight would include the subdivision amendment, pedestrian connection, um, landscaping. It's good to know that the um, owner who is selling this land is as interested in putting in a few trees as we are. That's good. Um, I, I have a hard time knowing exactly what to say about leniency about the lighting. I understand what you're saying, and I'm sure it'll happen, and I guess there's no way we can include that in our approval, except to say that um, we will be looking forward to having it happen. And other than that, I'm pretty happy with this. Thank you. Thank you. Roger? Thanks. Um, I apologize, but I wasn't here for your earlier presentation last month, or in March, which was last month. <laughs> 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 um, I'm just kind of curious about the parking. Is um, the, the new parking area, is that basically going to design to eliminate the need for the existing parking, or...? No, the existing on-site parking is uh, located in this area, and in fact, what's happening now, many of the employees are parking over on the main lake carting uh, property, and they have an agreement with that landowner, uh, so he's been using the parking over on that okay, side, okay. because that, that property doesn't need as much as they have, so, um, but they're just trying to get it closer right now. This is uh, just a cleared area along this side. They'll have to do a little bit more clearing uh, with the area that they acquire from that main lake carding property. Um, so will the original um, entrance, is that going to be primarily for like commercial use, like the loading dock? Yeah, the loading dock, what ends up happening is they back into these spaces. I believe there's four loading dock there, doors there, a couple of which are for, uh, you know, larger trucks. I'm not sure how much large semi-trailer truck, but they get box trucks in there uh, that need that four-foot loading dock. So they use that space, so they back in from uh, Washington and, uh, and have access to that space. Then you do have those parking spaces right in here, which I believe are really more intended for customers or visitors, at least for this front area here, because they do have an entrance door there, and some amount of parking for probably the uh, administration or, or the bosses, so to speak, probably park in here, um, but the rest of the staff has been either parking a few in here or over on the other oh, property. That was, that was what I was wondering. So the, the new parking uh, spaces are primarily for the employees. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know wh what the feeling of the board was regarding the two curb It was pretty <laughs> favorable. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. All right. Um, I understand. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's okay. I, I don't have any other questions, I guess. Thank you. Rob? Thanks. Um, kudos on the trees. Kudos on the boulders. I think the boulders are a great idea. I was envisioning, you know, these ugly concrete-filled bollards or something like that. I like the boulder idea. That's really great. Um, my only comment, Steve, is really, um, well, two things. Uh, follow up to um, Woodard and Curran's comments about the ponding that could potentially occur in the parking lot. Have you addressed that in the grading plan or adjusted we, ad we adjusted. They had a good comment or uh, recommendation about adjusting basically the control yep. uh, pipe size. And so we had a two inch hole, and adjusting that just to a three inch hole, in fact, allows the water not to pond up as much. This is on the 25 year storm event. You know, it's raining hard, but we've got that so it wouldn't yep. pond up over the, the parking lot. No, that's good. We had two 50 year events in oh, the last yeah. 12 months, so <laughs> that's good news. Yeah. Um, also, with respect to the lighting, I know that you, you mentioned the, the, the owner would be willing to make a commitment to upgrade that um, as, as maybe a, a condition of approval. And do you have any idea, like, is that within one or two years or is a year? These lights are 25 years old. If I touch them, they fall apart. Okay. So I just have to replace them completely for $600 a fixture. Um, Sorry, can you come up and just quickly introduce yourself, just for the, the record and... Uh, 
just so that your voice gets recorded. Thanks. My name's Jesse Abbott. <coughs> I have uh, a property at 4 Washington Avenue. Um, we just had a light fail over there uh, this winter, and I've just replaced it with a LED downlight, whatever. I'm not sure you're right terminology. Um, as soon as we touched it, it cost about $1,400 to replace it. And the reason why was we had to go and chase the whole circuits down because nobody had, you know, rewired it in the last 20 years. Um, so if you take the lens off, which is what we did to change the bulb, we had to replace the whole fixture. Sure. And that's most of these buildings that I buy, um, 4 Washington Avenue, 27 Washington, 25, 3 Commercial, they're all 1989, 1985, that era. And they are all need new roofs, um, which are four or five dollars a square foot. They all need all kinds of things. And to every time I for touch a time a, co commitment on the lighting, <laughs> like what what kind of time frame would you be would you be looking at I've, to upgrade the lighting? You know, um, this project started out at seventy thousand dollars, and we're over one hundred and forty now with approvals and all of the grading and everything else underground. So mm -hmm. I, I really didn't have a plan to put them in. Sure. Um, we, are, we did offer to put in two new ones that shine out on the parking lot, mm -hmm. and those would be those types of lights. Um, and I think we have to do the one over the employee entrance because it's flickering at this point, and I'm sure as soon as I touch it, it'll come unglued too. Um, but I think there's five more on the building, so you're probably talking, you know, another five to ten thousand dollars. It's not an inexpensive proposition. Sure. Um, but so I'm not time? answering your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but with all due respect, I mean Scarborough is a valuable place to live and do business. Thank you. Yep. I'm all set. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, um, you didn't get an answer. <laughs> uh, we could put that in as a condition, by the way, which no, might be a good idea. We, this. we can't? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think That's we could. Like uh, my question deals with, uh, actually it's going to go to Angela for the most part, uh, with the snow removal. Are you comfortable with the presentation as it is? as far as uh, snow accumulation and snow removal is concerned, Angela? Yeah, I think um, Steve addressed the, the real concern. I think because we don't, it doesn't trigger our post-construction ordinance, my concern was that we're not going to see it annually to make sure it's being maintained on a regular basis and that sediment um, from the parking lot, the sand, salt coming off the parking lot, just making sure that's away from those filter beds is really key. And so I think the I think what he's talking about the boulders and even coming plowing into the site, coming off the sides, if we would at probably strategically put those along that entrance and um, at the parking area, I think that would address the concerns with both the stormwater and the, uh, the I'm, snow storage. I'm happy with the sidewalk mm -hmm. and the, the pedestrian flow now. That was one of my con original concerns. I have no I, uh, no problem with the two driveways. I think they're very appropriate under these circumstances. And uh, if the staff's happy with stormwater and snow removal, so am I. I'm them. Thanks, Ron. Nick? I'm satisfied. Okay. Mike? Yeah, I, too, uh, applaud your uh, hard work from, uh, from our last meeting, um, in particular the new employee entrance, I think, you know, really satisfies that concern that was brought up about crossing over the um, the loading dock area. Um, the trees, um, the two driveways, no problem. I have no problem with uh, recommending the, the, the subdivision uh, amendment or in, in the site plan. As far as the cutoffs go, um, I mean, we are an industrial area, and it would be nice, certainly, if we could add that in, but uh, I'm comfortable with all the uh, enhancements that are being made to, the, to this day to uh, just uh, just let that uh, wait for another day. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm also generally uh, pleased with where we ended up here. Um, appreciate the responsiveness and on the um, the site access and circulation and the pedestrian safety and glad that you were able to sort of work things out with the, the neighbor to help facilitate some of those things. Um, likewise with the, the street trees. Um, 
I mean, I think I'm, I think I'm with uh, Mr. Wood on the lighting. I, I, um, you know, I think we've, we've made ourselves pretty clear on, on where we, where we are on that. At the same time, we appreciate the, the, the challenges here. Um, I think, you know, we do have to, it seems like we go through these stretches where we seem to have a recurring theme and we've gone through stretches where it's been sub, uh, conservation subdivisions. It seems like lately one of them has been these uh, industrial uh, zone sites. And I think sometimes there's a tendency, and I'm not, I'm not uh, associating this with any particular applicant, but I think sometimes there's a mindset of, well, it's in the industrial zone, so, you know, no, no big deal. Um, so I just want to make clear, you know, we're not trying to, we're not trying to make things difficult in anyone. We we never try to impose um, arbitrarily impose uh, conditions or or restrictions that are going to add cost. Um, we just try to we try to um, improve things where we can and make sure that we're within all of our ordinances and we try to be as consistent as possible. So. Um, when it comes to lighting, you know, certainly appreciate the full context there and the efforts that are being made at the site overall and, and elsewhere um, um, where the where the applicant owns properties, and we certainly appreciate and respect that. So um, you know, we'll certainly take the applicant in his word, and and that uh, you know we'll look forward to seeing that done when it's financially feasible uh, in the reasonably near future. So um, with that. Um, to said otherwise, generally happy with where we are. We do have a, a uh, motion for approval here, which does copy both the subdivision amendment and the site plan amendment. We'll just pass it along here. I move to approve the application of 25 Wash LLC, represented by Stantec Consulting Services, Inc., for a site plan amendment review under Chapter 405B Site Plan Review Ordinance and a subdivision amendment reviewed under Chapter 406 with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings as stated herein. Uh, the following waivers. The Planning Board grants the following waivers. Section 3C2, Landscape Plan. Given the nature of the project, the site's industrial setting and the proposal for five street trees, the Planning Board waives the requirement for a more comprehensive landscaping plan. Section 4B1, Site Entrance Location and Design. As proposed, the applicant is requesting a waiver for adding a second full service street connection, curb cut, to the site and a waiver of the driveway separation standards to other existing driveways. The Planning Board has reviewed this application and the town's peer review traffic consultant's comments and finds that due to the low volume of traffic on Washington Avenue and that of traffic entering and exiting the abutting driveways, the proposed driveway and its location will not cause unreasonable congestion or safety hazards. And the one condition is that prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall finalize the plan and submission updates to address the peer review comments by Woodard and Curran concerning the stormwater management plan and calculations. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Appreciate the board's uh, input very much. Thanks. Yes. Item number nine. Abco Rental and Storage Inc. requests a site plan amendment review for 95 Pleasant Hill Road, Assessor's Map, R78, Lot 84A and 85. Dan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the board should have uh, staff review comments, water and current peer review comments, as well as our Bill Bray, our, uh, our traffic consultant review comments. Um, on traffic consulting, Bill Bray has reviewed the project and is satisfied with <coughs> meeting site distance and um, other requirements around traffic safety. So that looks good in terms of uh, at least the peer review's view on it. Um, staff's been working with the applicant um, on updates and refinements to the plan, and I think we're, we're getting close. I think the one area that still has a fair amount of kind of coordination and vetting is the stormwater area. Um, and 
I know that the applicant's eager to continue working with Woodard and Kern and, and Angela on that. So um, I think a lot of the other comments have been addressed or in the process of being being addressed, but at this point, staff would recommend that a bit more time be given um, with our peer review and our civil engineer to work with them um, on sort of recon reconciling the stormwater design and all the, all the all the details therein. Angela can certainly speak in more with more specifics around that, but um, that's that's really where we are in terms of our review and recommendations. Um, if the board, after your deliberations, you know, gets fairly satisfied with the plan and, and where it's at, um, and stormwater is really the remaining issue. You know, at, at your next meeting, this could be a consent item if that's all there is really left, because it's certainly more of a technical um, review and, and back and forth. I don't know if the board wants to get into that. So, um, but that's that's where we're at. And um, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dan. And I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Steve Bushy again with Stantec here on behalf of EPCO uh, Rental and Storage. With me is Mark Sanborn, uh, another longtime property owner. I hadn't realized myself how long uh, that this property at 95 Pleasant Hill Road had been in the Sanborn family. Uh, it goes back to the early 70s, uh, in fact, that they've had ownership of not only this property but uh, others here in Scarborough as well. So. Uh, a longtime resident and, and landowner here, uh, uh, also seeking to, to do a little bit more development. Uh, the way the economy is uh, moving along right now, there's certainly a demand. This property, uh, located here off of Pleasant Hill Road, as we had outlined at the, the last meeting, so Pleasant Hill Road and then the railroad tracks located here. Um, they own this area here down to the river back up to the railroad tracks, then along the railroad tracks, and then the frontage along Pleasant Hill Road. Pine Tree Waste occupies this space. This area used to be part of the broader area until it was sold off to, to Pine Tree Waste. Access into our lot area is off of a driveway here, and the driveway shared with uh, the entrance to Pine Tree Waste here. Um, come into the area a number of existing buildings located in here, and I felt that this aerial kind of told a, maybe a more broader picture of the site location and, and uh, with this color here trying to show you what, uh, what we're proposing. The proposal includes uh, a little over 31,000 square foot building that would be uh, completed in phases, and I'll show you the first phase building, but basically they want to build a little over 11,000 square foot space here that would be basically just a, a multi space or uh, four unit area, uh, 90 feet deep, 130 feet uh, across with four units, each one roughly 28,000 to 3,000 square foot in size. Uh, the demand that is out there is really for these small business operators, people who may be currently operating either out of their home or uh, out of other leased area that is not ideal for them. Uh, they're the type of businesses that uh, might be a landscaper. So an existing tenant that they have now is main uh, turf and greenery, uh, and they expect to continue to, to have those folks stay there, or Williams Earthwork. These are small companies, uh, but there is also other demand for either other landscapers or an electrician or a plumber or some other uh, trades person that uh, I think there's a big demand here. Scarborough actually probably provides a pretty substantive uh, amount of that type of space to folks both in this industrial area as well as the industrial park, but it's a, it's a pretty big demand, at least in uh, my world. I hear about uh, uh, those types of tenants looking for space, and the Portland market's more expensive, and I think they can find that the Scarborough uh, market offers them a little bit more opportunity, affords them reasonable access to the highway. If you get on Route 1, uh, either north or south, to get on uh, 295 or, or the Turnpike. Plus, there's just a big demand, I think, within the Scarborough marketplace, Scarborough, South Portland, Portland uh, market areas. So uh, lots of demand for that. Uh, they'd like to start off with a, a single uh, building here, and then maybe in the future, given proper tenant demand, they'll add on to that with another uh, four-bay module and then potentially a, a third four-bay module 
getting up to that full 30,000 square foot uh, in space. Again, we have a number of buildings here, a couple of tension fabric buildings, a little uh, uh, building here, single story wood frame structure. Uh, mostly just yard area here, and I'll show a couple other graphics in a moment that give you a, a sense of the gravel yard area that's being used for various purposes today. Uh, equipment, some materials storage, uh, um, Williams Earthwork has piles of aggregate and topsoil and dirt and so forth that they routinely keep there. I'll note we have an existing stormwater management pond here. Now it's interesting, I don't know the full history of that pond. Uh, its primary functions appear to have been uh, more detention related, which you heard me say at the last meeting, the fact that uh, given this site's proximity uh, to the river here, the Nonsuch River, and this is, these are tidal conditions here, so the water goes up and down. So stormwater management back in the day wasn't necessarily, um, it would have been the objective, but I'm not really sure why uh, they tackled it in that, in that way. But what it's left us with is a good opportunity to take this pond now and retrofit it and really think about it in the context of water quality as opposed to the uh, flood control, fr flood standards. And uh, um, without really, I, I don't believe, really too much effort, we can modify this pond and make it into a pretty substantial water quality uh, measure uh, more than the, the flood control measure. So uh, I think that's a pretty substantial piece here relative to the improvement activity. Uh, so this does give you that context um, to give you maybe some sense, and I, I don't know the specifics, either Dan or, or others might be able to weigh in, and maybe if it comes a, becomes a question here a little bit later on, but the idea, and I'll just point it out, Dan and I talked about it a little bit today about the Eastern Trail uh, connection uh, that is going to hopefully happen here in the future, and the idea that uh, I believe the uh, Sanborn family has been uh, a, a receptive party to uh, the discussions about the trail potentially passing through their, their property. So we have the CMP land over here, where as I understand it, this is the uh, spot where the trail is expected to be crossing and going up through ultimately to Pleasant Hill Road. So there's just some, some things here that hopefully play themselves out favorably over the course of time. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Start with the uh, full site plan, and then go to the phase one plan. So this is just a, a blow up of that area. I'm going to try to put a little bit of color to give you some context of where the woods are and uh, the site area and so forth. So again, here is the entrance coming in off of Pleasant Hill Road, the Pine Tree Waste site over on this side, railroad track along the bottom of the page. So some existing buildings in here, stockyard area. There's a today a fence line, but the pavement that is out there in the driveway comes to this point and then it's just gravel surface area. So the proposal here to build these three different modules of a, of a building, 11,700 for the first phase and the reason being that's a little bit larger is that uh, we have one bay here which is likely to be occupied actually by the owner uh, with their business uh, would be a little bit wider. Uh, what they're looking at here is a prefabricated metal style building, uh, fairly light many other buildings in the industrial park uh, with uh, a pitch roof from uh, front to back, this being the front. They'll have man doors, they'll have overhead doors in the back, the idea being the floor plan would consist of a couple hundred, uh, 400 square feet of office space, uh, enough for you know a small shop owner, small business owner to have somebody answering the phone and uh, with a restroom. Then the rest of the space would likely just be open warehouse, uh, just but open space with an overhead door, allows them to drive in, uh, pull a trailer in, unload supplies, you know, that, that type of uh, use for uh, these prospective tenants. So each one of these spaces would have a man door as well as an overhead door in the back. Second phase, if they find, uh, you know, tenant demand is high, um, and that's, that's the trick here is to not overly build out too quickly and building all 30,000 or more square feet here uh, lends itself to the potential that 
you can't get it fully tenanted, so I think that's important uh, to be cautious there. And I think they've kind of positioned this building, expecting that they'll work with uh, you know one of the, the fabricated uh, prefabricated building suppliers. Uh, Butler being a particular style, I'm not sure that this would be uh, a Butler building, but they're a fairly common name, uh, and many buildings here in the industrial parks are uh, along that theme. Uh, the second phase, though, would be uh, again four. Uh, equally spaced <coughs> spaces at 9,800 90, 90, square feet, and then the third area at 10,800 square feet. We do have a little bit of a uh, inset here, and that's the owner's choice to basically set that middle area back 10 feet, simply to provide a little differentiation and to break up uh, the front facade. Not that it's visible from many areas, but uh, frankly, they just felt like they wanted to have a little variation in the building to make it look good. And so uh, that's what we've represented here, that we would have a little bit of green area uh, just to make this front area a little bit more softer in terms of tone and theme. It's not visible, but again, it, it uh, is something for uh, the tenants to be able to take, uh, uh, and visitors, I suppose, to have as a front entrance a little bit more welcoming. Uh, the work side of the site will be the back area towards the railroad tracks. And we provided some pavement just to keep things neat and clean up against the building, but then the rest of this would be a gravel yard area, uh, ultimately similar to, to what's out there. Uh, one of the comments from uh, our first go-around in, in March related to drainage and to provisions to have uh, stormwater uh, catch basins and pipe systems and so forth and in our latest round of submission packages uh, that's what we've, what we've uh, provided uh, to staff for review and we're certainly uh, amenable to the idea of what uh, Mr. Bacon has outlined about finalizing things up with uh, not only the staff engineer but uh, the peer review consultant. We're hopeful that we could move forward tonight uh, with uh, the idea of a consent uh, item on the next agenda would be uh, ideal. I think we can wrap things up, but it allows the uh, owner, as I had outlined to, to Mr. Bacon, there is a, a little bit of uh, urgency in that they'd like to begin the process of the building permit process, and that could mean just a few things to get kind of going here, and that is having a pre-application meeting on the building permit with staff. Uh, we could probably do that over the next few weeks and, and kind of just push things along. We're, it's Maine and the construction season's short, so um, and getting things ordered and so forth is always a, a priority. So we'd like to get that, uh, get that moving. I want to show, though, the Phase 1 building, which is really what they would be submitting an application for. And that is, uh, again, this 11,700 square foot building space here. So we have a driveway that would come in off of the existing driveway, I'm pointing out where the existing pavement is. And we would come off to the side of that, basically along the, the property bound, and get into a, a parking area here, as well as be able to drive around the perimeter of the building. And there are a couple key points that uh, uh, are required here, and that is, placement of the building will be over an existing sanitary sewer alignment. So that sanitary sewer crosses underneath the railroad tracks today and uh, comes to a point here to a manhole and it takes a hard roughly 90 degree turn to another manhole and then another 90 degree turn and continues on its way this direction. Um, couldn't find anybody, including David Hughes, who know the history of why uh, this line came in partially into the property and then 90 degree and then the 90 degree. We can only surmise maybe there had been some discussion at the time with the landowners about, well, we want to put a sewer across the, lawn, across the property and the landowner had certain ideas of, well, we're going to build a building here or there and they wanted to avoid it. Well, as it's turned out now, uh, the building wants to go here and it's right over the, the sanitary sewer. <laughs> Conveniently enough though, we can do uh, a reroute of that sewer uh, beginning at a manhole that is here and we would run it parallel to the railroad tracks and then take our 90 degree turn and then go down across the site and uh, that would work out pretty well. We've had an on-site meeting with uh, David Hughes. Uh, we expect that the Board of Trustees will be uh, giving us approval uh, this week uh, on that sewer relocation. It's a relatively deep sewer. It's about a little over 10 feet down, uh, so it's going to be a little piece of work uh, to relocate that, but it's 
it's one that uh, seems pretty reasonable and, and pretty straightforward in terms <coughs> of construction, but that will allow the placement of the building here then. So you see in the gray some new pavement area. Staff made a few comments in regards to uh, really this, this piece here, one of which was the softening of the, the radius given uh, our description of how tenant prospects, uh, you know, a, a small contractor or builder, what's he hauling around? Trailers more than likely and their ability to be able to come in here. Recognizing that this is yard area today that is seeing that type of traffic. Uh, they drive trucks in and out of these two buildings here uh, for repairs or what have you, or just parking them. Uh, but we softened the radius here. We did provide some grassed areas in here at the request of, uh, of staff. Um, so just to soften these edges, it seemed as though that was a particular comment that uh, staff and peer review had made. So we've, uh, we've shown that on the plan. The uh, end result is in this first phase, uh, we actually only disturb a little bit of woods area in here and woods area in, in the middle of the, the yard, proposed yard area in the back of the building. And that uh, disturbance will be about uh, 8,700 square feet. So that's actually pretty, pretty modest and actually allows us to meet an exemption standard under the site law. This uh, project uh, as well, um, as I found out now, actually got a site law permit back in the 1970s. It's one of the first properties uh, actually in 1973 to uh, fall under the uh, site law standard and they, they got a site law permit. So there is coverage there and I confirmed with the uh, DEP this exemption standard which allows up to 10,000 square feet of uh, additional soil disturbance, uh, unvegetated or non-revegetated uh, soil disturbance on a site law project. Um, you can do that in a single year and you're allowed up to 20,000 square feet ultimately um, before you need to go back before the uh, DEP. So that's actually an interesting exemption uh, that I hadn't realized. Uh, it's newer exemptions, they've got similar ones for uh, school and educational facilities as an example where they allow you up to 60,000 square feet uh, over a course of uh, multiple years. Uh, before you have to go back for uh, an amendment to your site law permit. So that will allow them to move forward on this phase one piece. We will, as we have told staff, have to go back for an amendment with a DEP for phase two and phase three. And we recognize that we're asking you folks for approvals for the full development, but uh, we would uh, kindly request if it be made a condition of approval for phases two and three that we provide that uh, uh, amendment approval from the department in advance of pulling a building permit for either phase two or phase three, simply because those, those may play themselves out in maybe a few years before they get into phase two or phase three, potentially. They, they want to do phase one this summer. Uh, so that's kind of where we stand and, and it seemed to work out reasonably well actually on the exemption piece. So um, happy with that. So that's the uh, key items here on the, the, the layout piece and we can talk a little bit more uh, perhaps in a moment about uh, a few other things on lighting. I'll note uh, the site is served by a uh, water line that comes into the property today for domestic service. We're going to be providing a new fire supply line though. In fact last year when the uh, town reconstructed Pleasant Hill Road as well as the district installing a brand new water main on Pleasant Hill Road, we stubbed out a fire service for this property <coughs> specifically. So there's actually a separate fire service for the Pine Tree Waste. There will be a brand new 8-inch fire service serving this property. And that large diameter main will be brought in. Uh, we'll be installing a fire hydrant here and uh, sprinkler service for the building uh, as well. So I feel like that's a, a major piece. As I said, with that sewer line, that's a convenient piece. We have just a very short uh, sewer extension, uh, 15 feet or so into the, into the sewer pipe, so that's, that's good. Uh, we will be uh, back on that sewer having to grant a new 30-foot wide sewer easement to the uh, sewer district. Their existing pipe is within a 30-foot wide easement, and uh, Mr. Hughes has given us uh, at least a positive uh, subject to the Board of Trustees agreeing with them, but a positive uh, recommendation that we'd be able to get an easement relocation effectively and as well as an actual relocation of the pipe. So 
So the drainage piece, and we talked about this a little bit, and the staff had made the comments uh, at our last presentation that the drainage piece was a little bit unresolved, let's say, and uh, so we needed to have some work done on that, and uh, we think we've taken some pretty sizable steps here, albeit perhaps with a little bit more input from staff and uh, peer reviewer over time, which we expect we can satisfy pretty well. But the uh, description that I gave about the existing pond, which is located right in here, now first the pond is pretty well overgrown. It's got standing water in it today and it's overgrown with, uh, with cattails and so forth, so it needs some maintenance and uh, uh, needs some upkeep in that regard. But our proposal is to convert it into a full-fledged wet pond, which uh, I'm pretty uh, um, optimistic that that should be pretty straightforward to do. Once we clean up the pond and excavate uh, the pond bottom, knowing we have an existing concrete box, that's the control structures located here, it's pretty visible and when you walk out there you'll see it. And it's got an exit pipe out of it and it's got a number of openings in the pipe that allow based on the water level in the pond for water to spill into the box and then go out through the control structure. Have to do a few modifications, close up a couple of the holes which frankly today they're pretty well clogged up already uh, so they're not really functioning but close those up and then create ourselves uh, a, a full permanent pool uh, with a depth of anywhere from three feet to four and a half feet. Average depth would be three feet, and that's kind of the minimum standard. So there was a goal in terms of what we could do to, I'll call it, retrofit the pond to meet the DEP standards for a wet pond. <coughs> We're able to do that, able to be, make a pond that will have water that will enter in on one end, then discharge down on the, uh, let's say, e uh, west end or south end of the pond. Now, the uh, piece to a wet pond in today's standards and uh, today's BMPs is to put in what they call a filter bench. So you have a permanent pool of water, and when it rains slightly, let's just say up to an inch of rainfall, uh, that water only exits the pond through the filter bench. And so basically the water uh, will build up a little bit of depth over that filter bench and then percolate down through a filter layer. And we've heard, and as you heard me hear, say in the last uh, presentation, I'm sure you've seen plenty of them now, uh, filter basins and uh, underdrain filter beds or uh, bio uh, retention cells or rain gardens, they all have somewhat the same idea that the water builds up and percolates down through a filtering layer of soil and then exits out through an underdrain pipe. So we would install that here on this south end of the basin and have that uh, be able to control a certain depth of water uh, that would come into the basin and not be freely discharging out of the pond. So there's the treatment, uh, water quality treatment piece. We have uh, the volume of water based on the standards and the guidelines of how you go about designing a wet pond based on the contributing area. You've got a, so much impervious area, and so much landscaped area that's going to drain water to the pond. And they, the, the guidelines suggest, well, the pond ought to have a certain volume in it that allows that to be big enough to provide good treatment. And we're meeting those standards. So that, that's all good. It's, it's uh, I guess, um, good for us that the pond doesn't need to have a lot of changes to it to be able to meet those standards. So. I am showing a little bit of regrading here, uh, not much more than uh, six inches to eight inches of material that just needs to be uh, cut off the side here just a little bit to uh, make sure we get uh, all of the volume uh, that we need for the pond. We have a closed drainage system that would consist of catch basins in the back or along the railroad side here, catch basins for the front area here, more inlets over on this side. So we're capturing all the water from uh, the developed area here going into the pond. So that too seems to be uh, work out pretty favorably relative to the, this pond that's been there for quite a period of time. Uh, with some minor adjustments to it, I think we can uh, really do good things relative to water quality benefits. So I think we need to walk that through with staff and uh, the peer review consultant and make sure that we're all on the same page relative to the calculations which we've submitted and admittedly they were uh, they haven't had a lot of time to be able to review those and uh, so we'd like to have that opportunity. I think we can do that successfully uh, over the next uh, few weeks here but that's where we stand on, on the drainage piece. I'll point out again just for quickly on the phase one piece so that the, the work includes all of the pond work, 
drainage pipe, drainage pipe out in the back. In the future, we'd end up uh, extending that just to the to the west here. So this actually shows you some of the existing yard area. This is a big pile of uh, dirt that's uh, piled up here today, but this is kind of the edge of the woods. So I was pointing out earlier that uh, you know that woods line here gets partially disturbed to be, be able to build the first phase of uh, parking out in front of the building, as well as a woods area over in here that would uh, end up getting disturbed. So uh, that's where we stand on the, the drainage and so forth. Maybe we can talk about this in a bit. This is not a great photograph. I uh, apologize for that, but this is a street view from uh, Pleasant Hill Road looking down into the site. And uh, so you can see the tension fabric building. So the new building is just, it'll be off into the background here. So it's set back a ways from Pleasant Hill Road. Have a pretty good stand of trees here along Pleasant Hill Road. I'll note that there are some smaller trees that have been planted in here because of this kind of opening area. Uh, I don't know my, a lot of the history there, but there are trees that have been planted and, and uh, hopefully over time they'll get high enough so uh, they kind of buffer this area. But you can see the site's generally pretty well buffered from, uh, from all around. I'll note as well that the pine tree waste piece has some trees that have gotten to their mature level, but they uh, certainly appear to have been planted to, with, a, with a purpose along this edge here. Uh, these evenly spaced pine trees uh, provide a pretty substantial buffer now. Besides the trees that are growing along Pleasant Hill Road, then the driveway and then another row of trees here. So uh, outside of just the driveway area here where you can look into the pine tree waste area, uh, and just the small little opening here as you cross over Pleasant Hill Road that you have some short window of chance to be looking down across the development site. Uh, frankly, our, our building area here, you're gonna see the, the narrow side of the building. You're not gonna see a lot of the building uh, along this piece, um, which I think is reasonably favorable relative to view and aesthetics and, and so forth. But Again, I think they're looking to build a, a you know, an, a reasonably good-looking building for the industrial setting. We understand some of the comments uh, that we've heard, though, about lighting and so forth. We've provided a, a new lighting package uh, because of uh, staff comments about our earlier submission here a couple of weeks ago included uh, a fixture style that staff found was not technically meeting the cutoff style. We just sub resubmitted a new fixture style that it would be a full cutoff uh, LED fixture and uh, we have a number of those along the, around the building here. There are a couple of pole mounted lights over the yard area, but beyond that, the, uh, the owner applicant here isn't really proposing to do any more site lighting for pole mounts or otherwise, just given the, their setting. Uh, they feel comfortable with what they currently have. Um, frankly, I don't know, I'd have to ask him about if this will be uh, continue to be a gated uh, situation. So they have a gate today that controls access into the yard area and frankly that's probably uh, a benefit for them relative to uh, security and so forth and, and maybe uh, downplays the need to have too much uh, site lighting. I, I note that there is some amount of lighting over here on the pine tree waste area. Uh, I'm not familiar. I don't know if there's any lighting here along Pleasant Hill Road. I don't believe there is. but. Um, so those are the, the pieces on the lighting is that we'd like to keep it to wall mount uh, fixtures only over the all of the doors and provide uh, what we feel is a reasonable level of security lighting on the building itself, but uh, not much more out in the yard areas per se. So um, that's our proposal. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Who wants to go first? Luke. Wow. Um, just trying to change it up a little bit. Yeah, real quickly, what are we looking for tonight? We're looking for phase one, well, all phases. And um, I think there was a uh, condition that I, you lost me a little bit on a consideration. You were asking the board for phase two and three. Can you say that quickly? Sure. That? What, what we'd be interested in, we're going to need a uh, DEP amendment for our site law permit for phases two and three. And um, if we were to get uh, a positive action 
next meeting with consent, um, which it wouldn't be tonight as I understand it, but would be on a consent agreement uh, or consent calendar for the next meeting, which allows some other things to fall in place. But uh, the condition would be that we'd have to provide that DEP approval for phase two and three prior to a, a building permit for uh, phases two or three. So what's before us tonight, Dan? <clears throat> um, tonight is site plan review, give the applicant feedback on the project, and staff is recommending there's enough stormwater um, you know, reconciliation between staff and peer review and the applicant that um, really the next meeting is the best time to approve the entire project. I see. So, okay. But if the board's generally satisfied tonight, barring some stormwater work, then you could put it on your agenda as a consent item where you don't get a presentation from the applicant. You just look at staff and say, is stormwater taken care of? Then, then we're good to move to a motion. Tonight. That's how you could handle it could next tonight. meeting. That would be for a motion at the next meeting. Under oh, consent. I see. Okay. Under consent, yeah. The motion would be asking for a consent for next session. Yeah. Well, I, I'm kind of leaning that way. I think that was a pretty comprehensive briefing um, on this site. Uh, I, I just had a couple of real quick questions. Um, I, when I look at the plan, I see temporary building um, parentheses trailers. So that's truly temporary. That They'll be going away once construction begins or reaches a certain point. It maybe once it reaches a certain point, they are temporary now because they are not they're not fixed structures. So uh, the temporary in the sense that they're not fixed structures, but not temporary in time. Right, they've been there now for a few years. Oh, okay, I misunderstood. Um, but they're not on foundations or anything. And I think we talked about this last meeting. I think it was in the notes also. Um, th does I don't see I don't easily see where on the site plan there's. Uh, demarcation where certain materials are going to be stored. Am I missing that? I mean, I see to the to the left of phase one, I see some references to stockpile material and wood chips, but I, I'm not sure that that's what what we were really talking about. I'd like to get an idea if the site plan that the site plan will actually show areas where materials might be stockpiled when the project has been completed so they don't tend to migrate. The intent today is uh, to have this back area that would be a, just a gravel surface area as the primary area of any stockpiling because it's got proximity to the overhead doors but it's also an area that's a little bit out of sight. Uh, it's not on the pavement that'll be out in front. You certainly don't want to have um, gravel. That's, that's the idea, but are they, is it demarcated there? Because, uh, you know, when I look at that, I, I see that there could be conflictions with the LP tank, could be conflictions with the dumpster. So I'm thinking the, the plan would be better served if you actually showed an area out, you know, where stockpiling materials won't impact these other... Uh, pieces of your infrastructure. Yeah, we had shown a, a dash line around that perimeter area. If that needs to be specifically called out as uh, materials, outside materials storage or something to that effect, uh, we can do that. I, I, think it, I think it would be well served just to have an area where you can, you can play in, if you will, for those kinds of things and show the board that it's not going to impact like I say, the tank, the LP tank, or the dumpster, or anything else you might have planned. It's subject to any particular code provisions, and admittedly, I couldn't tell you exactly what you may have in the code, but there probably are some specific restrictions on outdoor storage of materials, I'm guessing. Um, I don't know what those code provisions might be, but I'm thinking... Certainly uh, what, within the code. Yeah, okay. there's got to be something within the code that already has some dictate about what's allowed and not allowed. Well, we even go that far with uh, with commercial buildings uh, along, you know, well-traveled ways where mm -hmm. we, you know, folks want to put out, you know, barbecue grills or, you know, outdoor sales. Outdoor sales. We yeah. we ask them to, we, we we require them actually to show on the site plan where mm -hmm. those displays are going to right. go. So along that same lines, I think. Um, I think that's I think that's it for now because it's late and um, and I'm I'm comfortable. I, with uh, certainly not getting involved in an area that I don't have much expertise in. 
So I'm comfortable at this point in time suggesting that we do make a motion and allow for consent item next next um, next meeting. Okay. Uh, as far as long as you know the board and the rest of the board and you are, Dan. So. Yeah, and we can add outdoor storage um, notations to that list mm -hmm. with stormwater and any other board comments so that we can make sure those things are all addressed and you don't have to have another formal sure. discussion around it. Mr. Chairman, if I might, um, I do have a note here that had been put on the last round of plans, but I think it's worth uh, staff reviewing more closely, but I'll read it for the board's uh, benefit here. Uh, but So this is what was on the plan. We put a dashed line around uh, the various areas uh, outside of the LP tanks uh, and the note read approximate limits of outdoor material storage that may include but not limited to equipment, raw materials and pallets. All material storage shall be conducted in accordance with local codes, regulations and as directed by the Scarborough Fire Department. So that, that was the note. Uh, if staff wants to refine that. Um, we're the, note, the note's fine. Yep. In my opinion, okay. I, but I like the visual. The, yep. you know, the, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. I agree with Mike. Um, I think I think those are good notes to to bring forward, and I I think that's part of what we should be, you know, with the storage area, just delineating that. I think it'd be more comfortable with that, and I'm also comfortable with the, um, the idea of a consent item for next time. So it's a pretty thorough review and presentation of what we're looking at here. Thank you. Thank you. Ron? Yeah. Um, I'm generally uh, in favor of the of the total project. However, there are some gray areas that you're leaving, ifs and mites and so forth, that, that if we give free reign, make me a little uncomfortable. Uh, one has been mentioned, but there were a couple others that, that came up. Um, and I don't know if we can put in it that we're only voting on the first structure tonight, that the subsequent structures, if required, if built, uh, meet standards also, uh, as opposed to saying, okay, we approve the total project, and you build building one, and then decide to go off in a totally different direction as far as buildings two and three are concerned. Uh, that that's a little bit of a concern of mine um, as far as uh, giving free free reign here. And I know you have to go back to the DEP and uh, the history of, uh, of our past is the fact that we haven't approved things without DEP approval uh, in the past. Uh, so yeah, I'm a little bit in the gray area there. As far as uh, uh, what you explained about the pond, I'm very happy to hear the improvement you're going to make to the pond. That's certainly not an area of my expertise either, but I did follow what you had to say, and I think that will be a big improvement. Uh, over and above that, as far as stormwater, I am also going to leave that to the staff and peers to decide if it meets uh, their approval. Um, the lighting, uh, you know, that's okay. Um, going back to the propane tanks, uh, it was mentioned in what we received that uh, eh, that the setback of the propane. <coughs> you talk about that if you did. I, I apologize. I missed it. No, I didn't cover that. I'm glad you asked the question. But the fire department asked uh, and stated that they want to have a 30-foot setback from the railroad tracks, and we provided uh, for the phase one area here. I have a measurement of uh, 64 and a half feet to that tank, and then the other two tanks were about 50 feet from the railroad track. So that was good. The other uh, piece, frankly, that I didn't catch up with the chief on, and uh, he and I traded phone calls, um, was the I understood that there'd be a little bit of a comment about the bollard spacing and what his interest was uh, with how he wanted uh, the bollards spaced. Uh, you know, I put bollards there just so that there was a protective measure as opposed to putting a fence around them. Um, got to talk that through, I guess, with the chief as to what he may or may not want for uh, the spacing on that, and maybe staff or Angela know more. I guess I hadn't come across that before here in Scarborough with the chief, but I know they're particular on things, so we, we, we'll meet whatever he needs. 
uh, for that, but I don't know exactly what he had for spacing on, on that. So that would be part of the Yeah, we can get that addressed prior to the consent item at your next meeting. Okay. Um, one of the other issues that I read about, and uh, I don't know if you clarified for me, is the internal circulation of how things are going to flow. Uh, can you clarify that a little bit for me? So main access uh, continues uh, up to this point where we would have a, a bit of a separation. We want to maintain the existing asphalt surface that dead ends here, and there's a, a gate uh, today. Uh, there's a little area in here that folks park uh, for this building here. Main turf and greenery occupies this, this building. We also have, though, the new access drive that would come along this side that really is a little bit separate because I think they want to maintain this area for the tenant who is here, main turf and greenery, and, and these buildings. So the new tenants of this space would be coming in on this drive aisle here. Now one of the points uh, that I made earlier was on the softening of this radius because our earlier design showed this as a little bit uh, sharper. And I think the correct comment was, geez, the trailers behind a, you know, a pickup truck or something are going to go over that corner pretty uh, uh, commonly, so why not soften that out, which we've done. Uh, also, uh, putting a bit of a break in here was a staff comment. Uh, now, I'm sure the owner would desire to have this all just working space, and frankly, as a grassed area, it, it may see some amount of uh, stuff get put there, but we've we've shown here on the site plan that there would be uh, some boulders installed and some green uh, along this edge to give it some definition so that this is just a access drive. So they can pull into this access drive. This is a 60-foot traditional parking module out in front of the building. So we're just parking along the front, a drive aisle, and then other parking. And the comment that was made was why is there this other drive aisle? And it really it boils down to the ability for those uh, tenants to be able to drive in and then be able to loop back out and around, particularly if they're coming in with a trailer behind a, a tow with a bobcat or uh, you know whatever type of equipment they might be hauling. Uh, there's convenience to allowing them to be able to do that circular motion. Similarly, they'll come in uh, to this side here. We just provide some amount of pavement, but frankly, this will be a gravel surface. They can go into this backyard area as well. It's broad enough so that a vehicle with a, a pickup truck with a trailer on it can pull in, uh, make use of the overhead door in the back, or be able to just turn around and go right back out again in, in that manner. So it gives a little bit of a degree of separation because we know that this is an active area for uh, this tenant, uh, main turf and greenery, and, and, and the buildings here. So they wanted to have a separate zone, so to speak. And this is paved, and it allows some amount of just employee parking and so forth, but does allow them to come in with that pickup truck and go back out again. So that was really the, the, the gist of it. We have understood that the town comment about minimizing or, or thinking about amount, the amount of impervious and pavement, and we're sensitive to that, but the same token, we, we kind of felt that um, given what we hope to be a lot of good businesses here who are active and using pickup trucks, trailers, and the like, uh, giving them that ability to be able to maneuver reasonably around the site uh, was important also. So that's how we laid this thing out. That prompts two quick questions. One, reinforcing that we have demarcation of where things are going to be stored as opposed to just a haphazard coming in and going around to the <coughs> And two, the existing buildings, what's the flow of traffic and pedestrian for those buildings? I mean, is there any conflict between the new road to the new buildings and the existing buildings and how the traffic flows and people travel right now? Yeah, these two buildings here, so this is the primary building with some office space and so forth, so they uh, allow, it, this positioning allows people to come in here and they just park out in front and they can back out and out they go again. So this is kind of the, the office area. These are uh, really glorified garages uh, where they uh, park vehicles or do maintenance uh, on those vehicles. 
and then this is just some trailers here with you know parking that is allowed right down in front. Uh, these are just temporary trailers as well. Maybe these ultimately get replaced because the, this tenant, which is, uh, I, mean, I believe the main earthworks, gets to move into the new building here, and so that would go away. But uh, frankly, there's that amount of activity for main turf and greenery. They're using this space. Mark will offer some more. Mark, Sam, one. These temporary trailers are all going to come out after the construction. These tents and this uh, modular main turf is going to be the only tenant in all those. So we're going to keep them separate in this area, and all the other flow is going to be coming in here and going out. It's no longer going to go through this property, which it, used, it does right now. Okay. So safety-wise, it's going to be... All right. Well, that, that's what I was getting at. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That's it for me for right now. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Susan? Oh, before... I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. Before we move on, I just I wanted just to make a quick clarification on process. Um, I just confirm with Dan, as I thought, we we don't actually need to make any sort of motion tonight. That just by general kind of board consensus, we can set this up for to be a consent item at the next meeting. If that's there exactly is what general I was going to say. So I'm perfectly I'm happy. Ahead. I mean, this has been so vetted. I per, I thoroughly expect that staff can take care of anything at this point that is loose and bring it into us for just a, what's it called again? Consent. 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 Thank you. Right. Thank you. Roger? Um, I, I tend to agree with Sue. I think the presentation was very comprehensive and, uh, and I'll leave it up to staff and their expertise and our engineer to straighten everything else out. So I can come back and just say yes or no. <laughs> Thanks, like Roger. And tonight, I'm you're supposed to say yes. The consent part. Robin? Um, could you tell me, either staff or Steve, if the um, traffic study was done based on phase one only or phase two and three also? Because I'm still confused about what, what's in front of us, phase one or phase two and three as well. I believe it's done for all three phases. It's in the traffic memo, it, it cites 32,000 square feet. So that would be okay. all three phases. So uh, all three phases, it'll only be 32 to 35 trips per, per day. Okay. In the peak the hours? Peak hours. Peak hours. Peak hours. Yeah. So the okay. morning commute hour and the PM commuter okay. hour. Um, you are still seeking a lighting waiver. Correct. Um, we still don't have topo and grading. So, uh, uh, coinciding. Yeah, no, I'll uh, respond to that if you'd like, if I could. Just for well, this is where I'm going. Is I, I, I respectfully disagree with my colleagues that this is a complete and com thoroughly vetted. Um, because not only in addition to stormwater, I don't see erosion controls being taken advantage, uh, ta completely uh, vetted. Um, I, I do agree with Mr. Mazur that there are a lot of ifs and mites and gray areas kind of in, in this. And um, lastly, um, uh, you know, there's some, there's some in the Woodard and Kern comments, it says that um, it appears that the, will, the project will disturb over one acre. And so if, if you are looking at phases two and three, the larger common plan of development, there will be some triggers for, for DEP permit requirements that do need to be considered before it comes back to the board here. So um, with that said, and, and in, in the interest of time, um, I, 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 I respectfully disagree that this is ready for uh, board action. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess the, the point of clarification for me is, and, and maybe just to reiterate <coughs> what the sense really means, is that it's, it's not automatic. We're not saying that we're just going to come in and rubber stamp it, but it, it, it's, it, it's predicated on 
the applicant's ability to be able to work through these remaining these remaining items that are here, which which are some of which are substantive, absolutely, uh, which is why we're not contemplating a a conditional approval tonight, um, because it, it certainly it collectively that it rises beyond the level of just you know little loose ends for sure. Um, but I think that generally speaking, this has been very well. <coughs> with, um, I think we you know we. It gets tricky sometimes because we we want to provide feedback and we always want to try to make things better, but uh, it gets to to a point where we we can't sit here and redesign the site in real time. Um, so I, I think that's where we trust our staff and peer review um, and the applicant to work together. If it turns out that they're unable to work that out, then that's a different story, and we'll 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 be notified and. The agenda will be set up accordingly. Um, I will say on another point on the on the DEP question, and it is something that comes up. Um, we have generally, as a board, been a little more flexible when we're talking about amendments to DEP permits, and it is a little bit of a gray area in the sense that we've got sort of multiple phases and so forth. And it's true that if it's a brand new project. Um, with brand new approvals that we we won't approve without those being in hand and we won't even do it as a condition. So Ron's right in that respect, but but generally we have, as a board, been willing to be a little more flexible when we're talking about an existing site with, with existing permits that are to be amended. Um, and just a ahead, clarification around DEP permits. I mean, right now, for the last year or so, the town has local capacity for site location of development permitting and amendments. So if it's, I don't want to say just a site location permit because that's the most significant development permit, but if it's a site location permit amendment that's needed only, then that's something that this board and our zoning have the authority to do as part of your site plan approval process. We talked about that with the Grandin application mm -hmm. a few weeks ago where it's a new site law permit. So you have that in our growth areas, which the industrial zone is, we have local authority to do that. If it's another DEP permit, like a stormwater permit that maybe need to be amended or is being triggered, that's something we don't have local authority to right. do. So we need to understand you know, are we talking about site law amendment? Are we talking about another threshold with stormwater permit? Mm -hmm. And we we can work with the applicant to figure those things out in the next few weeks. And like you said, we can bring forward a consent item if all those things are vetted and the board doesn't hear a presentation and you vote on it. If there's still things that are incomplete or up in the air, then we'll talk with the chair about how should it appear on the agenda. Should it not be a consent item? So. Right. Chair, if I could just add sure. to that too, that um, I think it's much easier too to have all the information in front of us and to review it before we walk into a, a board meeting too, but to sit here for 45 or 50 minutes and hear from the applicant directly, I think is, is you know, we all could have looked through that beforehand. So in the interest of time, I think it's, I think it's important that we not set a precedent too for having meetings until I think it was 10.30, quarter to 11 that we were out last time too. But, but I, I think it speeds things along when you have everything to review beforehand, so. Right, absolutely, I, I agree. And uh, Dan, thanks for the reminder, kind of the clarification on that. I mean, that, that's a, a local capacity that's mm -hmm. relatively new and we're still kind of getting used to having that at our disposal. And um, it's something that will, I think, make things a little more streamline going forward. So with that, I'm, I'm uh, you know, it's probably clear I'm, I'm okay with things um, provided that these, these other uh, items can be worked out with staff. And I will say that staff, in my experience on the, you know, nine years or so I've been on the board, um, is uh, very diligent about this and, and um, you know, they, uh, they tend to err on the side of caution when it comes to to sort of making recommendations for things to go forward, and we also want, always want to be sensitive to not overburdening them with um, with a lot of loose ends to clean up. So, um, with that, unless you have anything else for us, I think we're we're set, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing the next uh, iteration. 
just a question of working with the uh, department condition because timing is going to be so as I had uh, mentioned at the onset, and this was an item that I talked with uh, Dan about, was to get the process rolling and getting perhaps a pre-application meeting on the building permit side uh, rolling, knowing we have three weeks until the consent uh, agenda, uh, but at least the ability to set up a pre-application meeting for the building permit submission, because we'd like to be able to theoretically submit a building permit within a short period of time after uh, the consent item. Uh, and just at least getting that meeting set up with the codes to talk about the building and so yep. forth. And yeah, uh, we can talk about that offline. I mean, okay. there's opportunities for looking at balls in, in particular, because we're not, I don't think the board's talking about interior or building specifics. We're talking right. about storm water and other site details that um, still need work, but we can start working on the building aspects of this, which can help on, on the back end for you. Yep. And it's relative to planning uh, comments. Uh, so the storage materials piece, that's a key piece to, to get that nailed down. Uh, and the stormwater piece is uh, the other key item uh, that we're going to get nailed down. Right. Okay. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Do we have a town planner's report? Town planner. Um, well. Let's see. I was just going to update you that we continue to work on the storm local stormwater standards and kind of furthering what we discussed at the workshop a couple of meetings ago. Um, we had a council presentation a few weeks ago along the same lines on some of the town's stormwater obligations. Um, and the other update that's more of a more of a preview than anything is um, the Long Range Planning Committee is actually beginning to look at updates to our comprehensive plan. Um, it's 2016 and 2006 was the last comp plan. It's <laughs> hard to believe. I know. When did, um, when did 10 years go? We just got it in, we, we just implemented the last <laughs> one. I think we just got the last dot. Time flies when you're having fun, Susan. Um, I know, it's such fun. So planning board is your key board to participate in that process, uh, undoubtedly. So. Uh, we have a really kind of a, a work plan in terms of what the calendar looks like on, on picking away and preparing for that. So nothing to share with you this evening but for the fact that we're going to start working on it and, and invite the planning board to participate at key steps along the way and get your input along the way so that you can, along with the Long Range Planning Committee and I think the Vision Committee and others can kind of help guide that process and be part of its formation um, given your kind of key role in, in this process. So that's what I that's what I have right now. Thanks, Dan. I would just quickly add to that that you know, I think the, the the idea is to one of the overriding idea is to continue um, with the, um, the practice of having that comp plan be a very active and and integral document and not a kind of an on the shelf mm -hmm. uh, a living document binder sort of thing. A living document if you will. Um, and I think it's yeah. been it's it's really been helpful to the planning board uh, and, to, and to applicants. Um, it gives everyone a very clear framework within which to work. So it's a really important process. Uh, do we have an administrative amendment report? I don't have any to report, no. Okay. Any planning board correspondence? Okay. Planning board comments? Yeah, we've got a uh, transportation meeting tomorrow night. And since yeah. I was away and just got back, we can Tell them what we have on the agenda tomorrow. <laughs> on the agenda, um, Pine Point Road. We have <coughs> Pine Point, section of Pine Point Road between the bridge that's being replaced right now and East Grand Avenue. Um, we had a public meeting, what, Angela, a month and a half ago? A yep. month ago? Yep, a month ago. Uh, to discuss updates to that road. To um, It's being repaved by DOT and Rather than just repaving it, we're looking at dealing with improving the sidewalk, potentially formalizing some on-street parking that's occurring down there to make it designated and safer as on-street parking, and consider um, bike lanes and those types of amenities given kind of the popularity in the summer of all those different activities. So we're going to talk about the outcome of that public meeting and next steps around that. Um, 
Angela's going to provide an update on the Oak Hill intersection improvements tomorrow night. Yes, and those of us who live off of Black Point Road know that there is work being done. Uh, <laughs> that's Unitel. That's Unitel. That's not us. Unitel. <laughs> <laughs> So. Eastern and Black Point Road is Unitel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what else are we going to uh, We're going to introduce assessment <coughs> management, something yeah. that came up with Pine Point subdivision last time here at Planning Board. So to kind of start that discussion yeah. and a bigger topic. What was that again? Access management. Like when we talked about with uh, Pine Point Road subdivision, shared driveways, oh, okay. things like that, um, and really where we need to control access along uh, some of our major collectors. Yeah. Washington Ave's not on the list, so don't nope. worry. You just approved. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. My only other comment is that I will not be at the next meeting on May 16th, so Mr. Mazur, try to be have a gavel. Anything else? Corey, I have a quick question about um, sort of workshops and the availability of them. Uh, as a new planning board member, I'm, I'm really working hard to try to get up to speed on sort of what the um, uh, expectations are as, as, as both a board member um, and also um, sort of what the, the development community expectations are as they come uh, before us kind of a thing. So I apologize if I was out of line by saying I'd rather see it beforehand than... Not than sit here and, and listen to somebody for 45 or 50 minutes, but I just, I, I guess I just want to sort of check in with the other board members um, on sort of what our collective priorities are as well as far as if we need, you know, criteria for, uh, you know, a, a light, the lighting waivers, giving lighting waivers mm -hmm. to some but not others, and, and so I, I guess I myself need a little guidance or feedback, so I would just workshops maybe are the answer. I, I, my answer to that quickly off the top of my head is we've got great staff and if there's any of those questions that you're not sure how we deal with it because you are new and we've been doing this longer, yeah. give Dan or, or Jay a call and, and they'd be very happy to fill you in on it. And as for workshops, they just kind of come when they come. Okay. This, this, it's like somebody will say, "Ooh, that would make a good workshop," and and then we have a workshop. But I, I really just want you to know that Jay and Dan are both sitting there at the ready, any time for any question whatsoever that has to do with how this board functions. I mean, that, that they're here to do a lot of things. Sounds like you want to stay later after. Right, okay. <laughs> no, but seri seriously, I want to finish making this point. They're here to do a lot of things, including making sure that. Scarborough is known as being business friendly. When I first started on this board, we were not known for being business friendly. Correct. I now think we are. Correct. And that's partly due to the board's attitude. It is partly due to this great staff. But their number one job is to make sure that we know how to do our job. And I think they do that beautifully. So take advantage of it. So I would just add that Angela also, because I've already tapped into her brain and is an expert. Oh, I know, resource. I know. And she knows more th in her little finger than I will ever know in both of my hands. But the <laughs> procedural thing, the procedural stuff, that takes a while. It just takes experience, and they can give it to you just like that. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with all that completely. And the other thing I would add is we, you know, we every once in a while, particularly when we've had a little bit of turnover in new members, we have had kind of a general sort of procedural workshop and mm -hmm. at least once we had town's attorney in just to talk with us a little bit about um, you know general general procedures mm -hmm. and what goes into being on a quasi judicial board and those sorts of things and it may be time to have another one of those um, for whoever can can make it and then there are also periodically outside workshops that are available that the staff will circulate emails on so and between uh, between all those things, there should be should be some different resources. Right. There. But Thank good you. Question. Anything else? We'll move to adjourn. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.